You're listening to Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. All right, Jess Menton, Paul Sweeney here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio uh, looking at these markets on a Tuesday, the first day of trading this week. S&P off about uh, almost nine-tenths of 1%. Uh, also below the 4,400 level. Yes, that's I, and we like, I like the nice round numbers. <laughs> so, that yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Uh, NASDAQ off about eight-tenths of 1% as well. So a little bit of a sell-off here. Uh, Calling it the WTI crude oil, it's selling off again today, off 2.8%. We're now firmly below uh, $70 per barrel, $69.78. So we'll keep an eye on that crude. Right now, let's head down to Washington, D.C. We got world and national news with Amy Mars. All right, thank you, Paul. A search is underway for a missing submersible that carries people to view the wreckage of the Titanic. Ocean Gate Expeditions confirmed it owns the missing vessel and that they are working to bring the crew back safely. Coast Guard Rear Admiral John Mauger says the search is challenging because of the area where the submersible went missing. The location of the search is approximately 900 miles uh, east of Cape Cod uh, in a water depth of uh, roughly 13,000 feet. It is a uh, remote area, uh, and it is uh, a challenge to conduct a uh, search in that remote area. The Coast Guard says there was one pilot and four mission specialists aboard. Mission specialists are people who pay to come along on Ocean Gates expeditions. The submersible is designed to have enough oxygen for its passengers to survive for 96 hours. Federal and state investigation is underway after authorities say more than 100 letters containing a suspicious white powdery substance were received by Kansas lawmakers and state officials. Republican State Representative Stephen Owen says when he opened the letter, he spotted white powder and noted how the envelope had a fake return address for a local church, a ploy that he says was designed to make lawmakers think it was from a constituent. They were definitely very methodical and very thoughtful. This was very intentionally meant to get lawmakers to open this letter. Kansas State Representative Stephen Owens described the experience as terrifying. The White House is set to hold a series of events this week to mark the one-year anniversary of the reversal of Roe v. Wade. First Lady Jill Biden is hosting a roundtable discussion today with women who've been denied medical care since the Supreme Court overturned the landmark abortion case. Global News 24 hours a day powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Amy Morris and this is Bloomberg. Paul and Jess. Thank you, Amy. Jess Mitten, Paul Sweeney here in the Interactive Broker Studio. And you know what, Paul, when I'm not with you, I do have another that's day job. That's I understand. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> I do have another job when I'm not here with you. And I did a story that was featured on the terminal over the weekend with one of our other star reporters, Elena Papina, on our equities team. And we're taking a look at how, obviously, so much discussion about the pause, yep. the skip when it comes to the Federal Reserve, what that means for the U.S. stock market. And typically, we've talked a lot about how a pause bodes well for the S&P 500 in particular, usually over the quarter course of three months, you do see the S&P 500 on average post gains of about 8% uh, when you go back since the 1970s. But what the tricky part of this is the skip. And there's only been two iterations where there have been a situation similar to this where there could have been a, uh, a skip and then another rate hike and then the Fed was done. It was in 1989 and then in the early 2000s. And both instances were very different. In the late 80s, the market rewarded that. But in the early 2000s, the market didn't. So it's a little tricky when it comes to sort of the historical and when Gina Martin Adams and her team at Bloomberg right. Intelligence are crunching this data, and it is, I wanted you to know, BI data that we are using <laughs> in this story, Paul, of course. So it is tricky there to see sort of what this means uh, as far as when it comes to the trajectory of a skip versus a pause. So we want, I mean, basically we want a long pause. Is that kind of, or do we want them just to... Typically, if, if there's a long pause, that bodes pause. well. Whereas uh, if there's cuts, aggressive cuts, that typically doesn't bode well for the market either because that's a sign of a weakness in the economy, like in the early 2000s. Yes, because that, that's what I'm hearing from some folks saying, hey, I, I don't need a rate cut right, right now because if I have a rate cut net right now, that means... The Fed sees something that maybe I don't see in terms of weakness. And that economy. typically is what the data shows. So tip, usually a pause would bode a little All bit All right, better. so we like pause better than skip. We don't need a rate <laughs> cut right now at some point in the future. That'd right. be nice. All right, I'm getting, I'm seeing how this all works out. So, uh, <laughs> all right, some good reporting by you and uh, Elena Popina uh, covering the markets there. Uh, so we appreciate that. Some good stuff. Um, again, looking at the markets here, we're just kind of selling off here a little bit here. Not a whole lot, but we'll point it out. Yields coming in, 10-year uh, treasury, 3.7%. We're going to have more coming up. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney. We got a lot of green on the screen here, but the volume is light. This is a market that's much more optimistic or bullish than maybe the central bankers are. 9.5 million job openings. What are people doing? Are they just sitting in Starbucks all day? Breaking market news and insight from Bloomberg experts. There's still some concern out there in the market that there is room for things to deteriorate a little bit more than what they're indicating. As small and medium-sized businesses struggle, they don't present as much competition. What are you guys thinking about hardware, software? How should investors approach this thing called AI. This is Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. All right, coming up in uh, this hour, some good stuff. We're going to uh, check in on the markets. We'll do that with Katie Greifeld to bring us up to date. Plus, Lee Klaskow, he's a senior uh, freight and uh, transportation analyst of Bloomberg Intelligence. We're going to preview FedEx earnings after the close tonight. Always a bellwether for the overall economy, so we'll get a good preview there. And Danielle Martino Booth, one of our faves, She's the CEO and chief strategist for QI Research. We'll get her thoughts on these markets and on the Federal Reserve. And remember that we are streaming live on YouTube, uh, Bloomberg Markets, that is. And you can just head over to YouTube and search Bloomberg Global News. Right now, let's head down to Washington, D.C. We'll get World and National News with Nathan Hager. Yep, this is what I look like. Thank you, yes, Paul. This all, stocks nothing continue. we can do about it, right? Yeah, what can you do exactly? What can you do about this market? We're watching uh, stocks continue to fall and uh, treasuries are advancing. There is the question about whether this market is getting overbought, what valuations are doing, and the question about the uh, Federal Reserve's policy path. Investors are going to be uh, watching very closely to hear what Fed Chairman Jay Powell has to say when two days of testimony on Capitol Hill begin tomorrow. Sebastian Page, head of global multi-asset at T. Rowe Price, says asset allocations are headed into a regime shift. He says that includes the classic investment strategy of 60 percent stocks, 40 percent fixed income. I think that 60-40 needs to be modernized. I think of the 40 uh, we should add maybe 15 to 20 percent in different alternatives and look for equity protection strategies. And so rethink diversification. This is a critical time for doing this. And we check the markets all day long for you here on Bloomberg. The S&P 500 right now is down 33 points. That's a drop of three quarters of one percent. 43.76 is the S&P level, so just below 4,400. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is down 285 points, or 8 tenths of 1% at 34,014. The NASDAQ is lower by 100 points, or 3 quarters of 1%, trading at 13,588. All 11 major industry groups in the S&P 500 are in the red. The uh, biggest decliner is energy, watching crude oil prices uh, fall. The NYMEX down 1.9%, or $1.33, $70.00. 45 cents gets you a barrel of West Texas Intermediate amid the risk off mood today. 10 year Treasury is up 1330 seconds for a yield of 3.71%. Two year yield is 4.67. COMEX Gold is down 1.2% or $24.30 at $19.46.90 an ounce. The Euro, some slight weakness against the dollar at 1.0906. The Yen is at 141.37. Bitcoin, just a touch higher, up a quarter of 1%, uh, just below 26,800. Just getting word that Amazon is facing a new congressional investigation into working conditions at its warehouses. This is according to a report in the Washington Post, citing an interview with progressive Senator Bernie Sanders, who chairs the Senate's Labor Committee. He says he's demanding information from CEO Andy Jassy on what he calls systematically underreported injury rates, turnover, productivity targets, and safety compliance. Amazon shares right now are higher by a tenth of 1%. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Bloomberg Markets continues now on the radio and on YouTube <laughs> with Paul Sweeney and Jess Menton. All right, Nathan, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate that. Jess Menton, Paul Sweeney here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Seeing a little bit of a weight to the tape here today, uh, but there are lots of news, lots of stories going on underneath the surface. Let's check in with Katie Greifeld, Chief Cross Asset Reporter for Bloomberg News. Joining us here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Katie, what are you looking at? I have been watching this story really closely. It's in the ETF world, of Ooh. course. So, I mean, if we rewind back to January, this was supposed to be the year of fixed income, right? And then it turned into the year right. of artificial intelligence. And now, <laughs> of course, the stock market is sitting on double-digit gains and then some. Well, we finally saw a flip in the flows. I was checking it this morning. Equity ETFs in the U.S. have taken in about $102 billion year to date versus fixed income ETFs have taken in about $93 
$1.5 billion. So we finally seen that dynamic flip. Pre previous to June, we had really seen the fixed income funds taking in more money, and that's where the bulk of the new inflows were going. And that's finally flipped. It took a while, uh, but flows do follow performance, and uh, we can finally say that that adage works again. So over the past month then, it sort of mm. made that shift, obviously being fueled by AI. Yeah, it's been really dramatic. Just again, in the past month, uh, just the pace of equity ETF inflows, you still do see new money coming into bond flows, uh, into the bond funds, but it's really dropped off compared to January, February. And then in March too, when we had, you know, the banking crisis, mm -hmm. yep. if we're allowed to call it that, uh, you really did see flows into bond funds pick up. But now it feels like the FOMO just got too great, and you are seeing that translate into money. And is the money still going primarily just to the big monster kind of S&P kind of funds? I know there are so many niche ones mm -hmm. coming out from a lot of niche players outside the big three or four players in the ETF space, but where's kind of the equity money going? It's kind of all over. I mean, thematic ETFs, yes, which is like right. shiny stuff, uh, they've started <laughs> to, you've seen flows there pick up. You have seen a lot of, uh, you know, money, to your point, go into those large index tracking, large cap sort of funds. And also even still sort of the more defensive plays within the equity market are also seeing love. There's a, a big equal weighted ETF I follow, RSP, that's the S&P 500 equal weight. I mean, that's seen some mm -hmm. record inflows. Some of these income generating strategies that sell call options for example they're also seeing some love as well record uh, flows going into JEPI in particular that's a JP Morgan fund so even though I mean you could look at that and say it's bullish you are still seeing it spread out into defense, defensive strategies, but still in the equity market. And was this, when you were stating those numbers, is that for U.S. equities or globally? Exactly. That is primarily U.S. That's just U.S. Very this is a story on a global scale. Uh, Eric Valchunas tracks these numbers very closely. But just looking at the U.S., we have finally seen that sea change, if you will. We should have a TV show on ETFs. I know. <laughs> we, I think we do, right? I feel like Katie this, should be the host. This no? week is really <laughs> kooky. We joke all the time that, okay, it's on Mondays, but sometimes on Wednesdays. This week, it's on Wednesday. It's also at 1.30 instead of 1 p.m., just to make everything. And what are you guys talking about this week? This week, we're going to be talking about that flip. We're also going to be talking about BlackRock because last week they filed for a physically backed Bitcoin ETF. That structure does not exist in the U.S. The SEC has denied it over and over again. Right. So is this anything different about this one, do you think? This one is physically backed, so that's okay. different. And in terms of what their thinking might be, there's a lot of speculation that oh, BlackRock must know something that we don't. So uh, you have seen a lot of rumors flying around, a lot of speculation flying around, particularly on crypto Twitter. Uh, how this shakes out, we'll see. This should you know, be a story over the next couple of months. All right, everybody should tune in then on, on and Wednesday. Is that with, you have a co host on that one? <laughs> yeah, Matt Miller. I don't know if you guys really? know him. Okay. We've heard yeah. of him. He yeah. heard of he Matt. comes and goes as, as yeah. he Yeah, Eric Falchun is too from Bloomberg Intelligence. He's the man. He's off this he's week. He's great. So I have to pretend to be Eric as well. Okay, he's kind I of the brains him. of the operation. Right? On, <laughs> on all things ETF for Bloomberg, Eric Falchun is one of our go to folks. We appreciate that. All right, Katie Greifeld, thank you so much uh, for joining us. Katie Greifeld, she's a cross asset reporter. Star reporter. Exactly, star reporter. All right, let's talk about a big Bellwether name. Uh, it's a name that Kriti Gupta follows very closely. Yes, for she does. To television it's an important name. It's an important name because it really goes to a big, big segment of the U.S. economy we're talking Logistics. about. Logistics. Exactly. FedEx, uh, Federal Express, they're reporting earnings after the close. Let's get a little bit of a preview here with Lee Klaskow. He's a senior analyst. He covers freight transportation and logistics for Bloomberg Intelligence, uh, and we appreciate getting a couple minutes of his time. So, Lee, FedEx after the close tonight, what are you looking for? Uh, I'm looking for what kind of progress they've made uh, with their two big strategic initiatives uh, that they have uh, called Drive or Network 2.0. Specifically, I want to see what kind of progress they've made at combining their ground and express networks. We're not expecting ground changing um, changes, if, if you will, but we want to see some, some change nonetheless. Also interested to see how much share gains they've gotten from UPS because of the labor issues that UPS is having right now. Um, obviously, there was some big news last week when uh, the union uh, decided uh, that they gave uh, their leadership the permission to strike if need be. Uh, so, you know, that's obviously a headline risk. We don't think a strike is likely. We think that's a pretty low probability, probably come down to the wire and they'll come 
out with an agreement, but the reality is between now and that agreement's uh, reached, uh, shippers might get a little skittish and decide that they want to kind of diversify their exposure away from UPS just in case uh, they do decide to strike. And when you think about FedEx versus UPS, obviously very different business models, and especially UPS having those issues with parcel demand continuing to slow. We heard that from them um, just a couple months ago with their last um, earnings report. When it comes to FedEx, what do you think this really tells us when we're looking at the logistics business? Obviously, a key indicator when it ties into how the global economy is performing, not just this year, but obviously what that could tell us for next year and the next few years as people continue to debate this recession scenario. <laughs> Yeah, freight providers across the board are really kind of like um, becoming like the normalizing. There's like a new normal becoming out of uh, the pandemic, and and that's what everyone is looking at. We're we're seeing a reset, whether it's in parcel, railroads, trucking, uh, and that 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 reset is driven uh, really uh, for some of these modes on the rate side, but obviously on the demand side as well. Uh, and, you know, things are still pretty good from a demand standpoint. From our point of view, you know, we're still better than pre-pandemic levels. We were just uh, at really high levels during the pandemic, and we're seeing, you know, rates come down and demand come down. You know, express demand might be down anywhere between 7 and 8% uh, this quarter, where their ground business might be down uh, closer to mid-single digits. Uh, and also, you know, they're less than truckload business, which is their smallest business, but it's also one of the largest LTL carriers out there. Demand there is expected to be down around 10 percent uh, as the industrial economy is kind of uh, slowing down here in the United States. Hey, Lee, how does, uh, you know, when you're out on the highways and byways these days, I don't know, I just see a million, a million Amazon trucks out there, <laughs> uh, including those electric ones that are around everybody's neighborhood. They, they seem are. like they're parked everywhere. How does the Amazon fleet kind of compare or tie in with kind of the other fleets out there for just moving stuff around? How does how do they fit into that whole ecosystem? Well, they're, they're more or less an, an asset light um, business. So a lot of the capacity they have, it, it's not, you know, Amazon employees or independent contractors. That's kind of a model that um, FedEx Ground operates under. Uh, but obviously, it's a much different model than UPS, which is a, a Teamsters organization, uh, and it's all you know company employees. So you know all the all those folks that you're seeing out there, they're working for small businesses that you know they might own two to twenty trucks, uh, and they you know do routes for for specifically for Amazon. So you know I, I think that you know what it's telling you. You know we've never really thought that Amazon is going to go head to head with UPS and FedEx. Um, you know, maybe they're frenemies, but the reality is that if you're a retailer and you compete against Amazon, you're probably not going to want to use them for your final mile <laughs> delivery. You would want to give your, you know, your competitor um, some money, if you will. Uh, and what what Amazon is doing is they're building out this network uh, just to really lower its cost uh, of delivery, so they can rely less on the FedExes and UPSs and the fact that they can kind of, you know, just dictate the price and they can really control their own costs. And that's what we're really seeing is Amazon is looking to control their own costs. Uh, and then, you know, they'll be selling or reselling some of their excess capacity to third parties. Frenemies. Yeah. I, I chuckled at that one. I love that. I wanted to go back because last September was whenever FedEx had talked about and pre-announced these weaker than expected quarterly results. But since then, we have seen that stock rebound close to about 50 percent since then. What has FedEx done since then to really boost that confidence among investors? Yeah, I think that, you know, people really like the fact that FedEx is taking step towards uh combining its ground and express network, as I mentioned earlier. And again, that's going to be, you know, a key to their success moving forward is this, is their ability to, to, to execute on that plan. Um, you know, FedEx had a, a lot of issues with execution. You know, they bought uh, TNT, uh, which is a big European parcel ground, ground network, and that took four to five years to fully integrate. Uh, you know, some things were beyond management's control that happened at TNT. But other things were just really uh, poor execution on their part. I think that you know they're finally building uh, um, some some investor confidence in their ability to execute. Uh, and, and the next couple of quarters, I think, will be key for them. Where on the other hand, UPS, you know, they've had a, a recent they've had a management change a couple of years ago with Carol Tomei, and she's done an excellent job at really 
focusing the company and uh, driving costs down and improving productivity. And, and FedEx, you know, is really just playing catch up to UPS right now. You know, Lee, I can't even remember the last time I dropped a package off at the United States Post Office. I mean, it's been a while. It, it, where does the U.S. Postal Service stand in this whole, I don't know, lo logistics kind of thing that you look at? Are they even, I mean, I don't know, they're everywhere, but I never use them. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I, I, you know, at the, at the end of the day, they're still one of the largest. Uh, well, they are the largest deliverer deliverer of, uh, of, of packages and letters uh, across the, the country. They deliver to every address in the United States. Um, you know, they're somewhat subsidized. Uh, they're they're going through their own transformation, trying to be a little more productive. Uh, and being able to maybe compete better with the FedExes and the UPS from a, from a service standpoint, um, you know, so that's that is uh, um, you know something we're going to see. And you know, the UPS, um, sorry, the, the Postal Service leans pretty heavily on FedEx as their network, uh, and that contracts up for for renewal, I think, this year or next year. Uh, and that will be pretty interesting to see how much of that contract that FedEx gets uh, for that you know line haul airlift. Uh, you know, we suspect that the Postal Service might, you know, rely less on air and more on, on the ground, uh, which might, you know, hurt that contract uh, longer term. We only have about a minute left, but back to the point when we were talking about a recession, do you think this is really telling us that a recession is headed when you are looking at uh, FedEx and their earnings? Well, I, we're definitely in a freight recession. So, you know, I look at railroads, trucking, parcel, I look at pretty much everything and everything from a volume standpoint is down. And again, it's against extremely difficult comparisons. You can have a freight recession without having a, you know, a technical economic recession that's happened in the past. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that, you know, there's a good probability that it could happen this time. You know, our base case is that we're going to have a mild recession. Um, you know, it's probably something very short and shallow. We can call it the Lee Glasgow recession. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, so it, it's really, it could be a recession that maybe even consumers don't even feel. It's just a technical recession. So, you know, what we're seeing, again, it, it's, it's really a rebalancing, a renormalization of demand and rates. And that's what we're going through. Uh, and again, demand is still better than it was in 2019. All right, Lee, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, really appreciate it. Lee Klaskow, he's a sector head and senior analyst covering freight transportation and logistics for Bloomberg Intelligence, uh, joining us via Zoom from uh, the home office. Uh, markets right here, uh, just still on, still in the red right here, the S&P 500 off three quarters of 1% uh, of 43.76, so below that $4,400 level. NASDAQ off about seven tenths of 1% as well. We'll have more coming up. This is Bloomberg. Get some company news right now with Steve Rappaport. All shares of Eli Lilly and Dice Therapeutics are up after the former agreed to buy the latter for about $2.4 billion. And that amount is a 42% premium above Dice's closing share price on Friday. Shares open today more than 37% higher. The transaction is expected to close in the third quarter. Big drug makers have been shopping for biotech firms with immune therapies that can fill a variety of patient conditions. Shares of FedEx are down ahead of the company preparing to release quarterly earnings after the bell. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines reports. Earnings are expected to be down 29% from the fiscal fourth quarter period a year ago to $4.87 a share. And revenue was seen falling about 7% as the demand this company enjoyed during the boom times of the pandemic has faded. Now, it is worth noting in the prior two quarters, FedEx has beaten expectations uh, quite remarkably. It was 26% uh, higher the profit in the period in March than expectations. So we have to keep in mind that there is uh, the possibility of a repeat there. Thanks, Kaylee. Four members of Congress will visit Detroit today. They'll be meeting with top executives of GM and Ford. The lawmakers, all members of a new China Select Committee, will urge the automakers to reduce their company's reliance on China, especially when it comes to batteries for those electric vehicles. And it's the largest commercial jet deal in civil aviation history. Indian discount airline Indigo has agreed to buy 500 Airbus jets. The Wall Street Journal reports the deal is estimated to be worth $50 billion and would more than double Indigo's current fleet size. It is also important to note, though, that airlines tend to offer steep discounts for bulk orders. And those are the company stories we're following this hour. I'm Steve Rappaport. This is Bloomberg.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Coming up to 11.22 on Wall Street, I'm Nathan Hager watching stocks continue to slide on this holiday shortened trading week, the start of it anyway. The S&P 500 is backing off from the 14-month high it reached last week. All 11 major industry groups in the S&P 500 are in the red, dragged lowest by energy and materials. The biggest downside mover in the S&P right now is Solar Edge. Those shares are down 8.4%. Among the upside movers is PayPal. Those shares are higher by 2.6%. The payments giant cut a deal with KKR to buy about $44 billion of its buy now, pay later loans. It's a move that could allow for PayPal to do more share buybacks. We check the markets all day long here on Bloomberg, and the S&P 500 right now is down 34 points. The Dow is down 320, and the NASDAQ is lower by 95 points. The 10-year Treasury is up 13 30 seconds. The yield 3.71%. Two-year yield 4.67. NYMEX crude is moving lower, down 2.2% or $1.59, $70.19 a barrel. COMEX gold is down one and a quarter percent, down $24.50, $19.46.70 an ounce. The euro weaker against the dollar at 1.0907. The yen is at 141.34. Bitcoin's trading higher by two tenths of one percent, just below 26,800. A new crypto exchange backed by Citadel Securities, Fidelity Digital Assets, and Charles Schwab says it's gone live. EDX Markets was announced last September as an institutional only exchange trading just four tokens on a non-custodial model. That means it won't hold clients' digital assets during trades the way Coinbase and Binance do. Of course, those exchanges are under heightened regulatory scrutiny in the U.S. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Bloomberg Markets continues. Paul Sweeney and Jess Menton. Thank you, Nathan. Jess Menton, Paul Sweeney here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. And of course, what else can we continue to talk about, Paul? But <laughs> obviously, the Federal Reserve with Fed Chair Jerome Powell going to Capitol Hill on Wednesday and Thursday. So I want to bring in our next guest, Danielle DiMartino Booth, who's the CEO and Chief Strategist at QI Research, joining us to, of course, talk about the Fed. Danielle, how are you? I'm doing great today. How are you? Doing well. So I want to get your take now that we got off the Fed decision last week and obviously going to hear from the man himself again <laughs> this week. What were your expectations as far as going into this? And also, what was your sort of take now that we've gotten past the Fed decision last week? Well, from the perspective of a former Fed insider, to, to say that it's exceedingly rare to see the Fed truly pause and then resume rate hikes, I will believe it when I see it, and I'm happy to be corrected, and that's what the market is pricing in right now. But this is a highly unusual situation. Uh, but again, the markets are sitting at about 74% probability that there's another go come July, but there's a heck of a lot of data between now and then. Um, you know, Starting off on the terminal this morning, you see that private equity firms are having a very hard time hedging, and at the same time, you know, used car loans are uh, upside down. This is a story that we would have read about in 2008, but about homes. But the average loan to value is 125% on used cars in the first three months of 2023, according to, to TransUnion. Clearly, the Fed's campaign has had an effect in many different places. It seems to me, Danielle, I mean, you're, you're the expert here, uh, having been uh, at the Dallas Fed, but it just feels like from a optics perspective, I wouldn't want, if I were on the Fed, I wouldn't want to pause and then just kind of restart the next meeting. It sounds like I don't have much conviction one way or the other. Well, you know, it was interesting because Powell definitely threaded that needle in what he said at the podium. He said the data that we have over a six-week period, that's much different than the data we have over a three-month period, which is more trend-like. So he was actually answering your question in advance saying that by the time we get to the July meeting, we will have enough to establish whether or not the lag effect has created a trend in the data or whether it's a blip and we still have a lot more work to do on the inflation front. I was, uh, his answers were extremely choreographed and extremely careful, but he did make that distinction. Danielle, are you managing money? Uh, we advise institutional investors. So we, um, I think our most, our, our what they thought was our craziest call was in June of 2021. We said that the yield curve would invert uh, to triple digit 
negative levels and stay there when the entire street was saying, no, no, we're going steeper, we're going steeper. We're of the mind right now that higher for longer is being reflected in the persistence of the negative inversion in the two-year tenure, which is pushing 100 basis points again today. How are you advising clients to position whether or not there's a couple more interest rate hikes or not? Well, what we're telling clients right now is that time is on their side. If, If you have the optionality of actually making a return on your cash right now, then there's absolutely nothing wrong with being, uh, having a little bit of dry powder, having some cash on the sidelines. By the same token, we think that given what we're hearing about household finances and this aha moment in October when student loan payments resume, we think that a lot of the consumer discretionary uh, stocks and names and sectors have gone way, way over their skis right now on the assumption that everything's going to be fine and the Fed's going to ride it right into the rescue with, with rate uh, cuts. We don't see that as happening, but yet we are seeing some severe uh, uh, distress emanating from the U.S. household sector. So, uh, again, I'd I love to get further thoughts there, I mean, Danielle, because I'm not sure really how to handle or phrase or characterize this, this economy. How tough is it out there? I find myself you know, stuck here in New York, and if I go right. anywhere, it's San Francisco. But how is it out there? What's the data telling you? Well, the data, you know, actually this week's Quill, I'm I'm writing on big anic data because it's more of the anecdotes that you're hearing that tell the bigger story. We have to recall that it, it's, it's advertised on every medium known in, in, in financial media. The employee retention credit is pumping about $20 billion a month into the U.S. economy. That makes it really hard to tease out spending trends when the highest income earners are getting $20 billion a month from Uncle Sam in leftover CARES Act spending through the IRS. So that's a really big uh, swing factor, about $200 billion in the last three years or so, marginal increase to high net worth in- individuals, if you will. You parse that out. You know, there was a, there was a documentary that aired a few months ago about a Phoenix uh, food bank, for example, the, the local TV station just revisited that same food bank, and prior volunteers at that food bank are now going to the food bank for food. So we, we're, we're seeing a turn. There's a huge bifurcation in the U.S. economy right now where the haves really have it, and the haves not are mm-hmm. really struggling, but it's hard to pick up in the data. Right, in the bifurcation, just looking at some of the housing data this morning with housing starts surging the most since 2016. And so that's suggesting that residential construction could be on track to really help fuel economic growth. But to your point, how do you square some of that data away where you start to see some cracks with the consumer, even though we've seen other consumer data like retail sales still keep up? Well, we are seeing retail sales keep up, and we should, given we're seeing month after month of record uh, uptake on credit cards, as well as the extra $20 billion that I just said is being pumped into the economy via the the ERC tax credit. So um, we we should be seeing these numbers given the amount of money that's being taken out and or given away by Uncle Sam. But when you see housing starts, uh, hat tip to Randy Woodward for, for pointing this out to me, when you see starts, at the, at the highest level compared to permits since the 1990s, there's something funky in the data, especially when we learned that $31.2 billion of residential loans saw a negative in the Fed's H-8 on Friday after the close when everybody had long since left for the long weekend. So there's, from what I'm hearing from home builders and, 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 and from people who study the industry, right now builders are buying down points, so you're, you're still borrowing in the 4% range if you're buying a new home. The assumption is that the Fed is going to lower interest rates, making it that much easier to push this spec supply out into, into the housing market and for there to be people who can actually afford it. But again, a lot of people, whether you're talking about home builders or you're talking about individuals making loans, loan officers at banks, a lot of the decisions are being predicated on the assumption of Fed rate cuts going forward. So on that front there, rate cuts. I mean, it keeps getting pushed out, pushed out. What is your call, given the data right now? Well, I don't... uh, If if any of you are Star Wars fans, you know, these aren't the droids (laughs) you're looking for. When when, when Powell was asked by Politico.com about quantitative tightening, he basically 
gave her that answer. These are not the droids you're looking for. We're not talking about the balance sheet. Yep. It's going to continue to run off in the background. Now, he can only do that if he maintains high interest rates. You cannot cut interest rates and have quantitative tightening going on at the same time. They're, by definition, contradictory policies. So for him to keep shrinking that balance sheet, all he has to do is not hike anymore, just keep rates where they are. All right. Well, it was really great having you, Danielle, as far as just breaking down the Federal Reserve, all things Fed, ahead of Fed Chair Jerome Powell's testimony on Capitol Hill on Wednesday and Thursday. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me today. Well, Paul, taking a look at these markets, still the S&P 500 uh, below 4,400, which was a key threshold that we yep. saw. It eclipsed that, and you were bringing up crude oil prices earlier. Some of that pressure is happening when you're looking at energy and materials more broadly, looking at energy down more than uh, close to actually 3% in the S&P 500, materials down close to 2%. But something I wanted to point out about sort of broadening out, we talked about industrials, how they are inching toward a record in the S&P 500. 500, but also transportations are holding support. So when we're talking about some of this broadening out in the equity market, even though we see markets a little bit lower, there is still some optimism underneath the hood there, Paul. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll have to see how this plays out. But there's definitely some movement happening uh, out there in the marketplace. We'll stay on top of it, of course. Right now, let's head down to Washington, D.C., World and National News with Amy Mars. All right. Thank you, Paul. The Justice Department has charged President Biden's son, Hunter, with federal tax and weapons offenses. Hunter Biden has agreed to plead guilty to two misdemeanor charges of failing to pay his taxes on time and avoid prosecution on a separate gun charge. That agreement must still be approved by a federal judge. He is expected to appear in federal court in Delaware in the coming days. The judge in former President Trump's document case has set a trial date for August 14th. Trump pleaded not guilty last week in a Miami federal courtroom to federal charges that he mishandled state secrets. Trump, who is attempting a comeback bid for the White House, is the first former president who has ever faced criminal charges. Secretary of State Antony Blinken wrapped up his trip to Beijing, having seemingly made strides in U.S.-China relations. China's President Xi Jinping met with Blinken and said they made very good progress. Bloomberg's Stephen Engel says China later said the meeting was a courtesy and placed blame on the U.S. for any frictions in relations. Shortly after Blinken's plane left Beijing yesterday, uh, the state television, through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, basically downplayed the meeting in the Great Hall of the People that lasted 35 minutes as a courtesy visit between Xi Jinping and Antony Blinken, and then again laid the blame on the United States for causing the friction. Bloomberg's Stephen Engel reports that Chinese Foreign Minister Ken Gang plans to visit Washington in coming months to keep those discussions going. The Coast Guard continues its race against time to find a missing vessel used to explore the Titanic. The submersible is designed to have enough oxygen for its passengers to survive for 96 hours. Five people were on board the Ocean Gate Expedition's vessel when communications were lost on Sunday. Among those on board include British billionaire and famed explorer Hamish Harding, according to his family. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Amy Morris, and this is Bloomberg.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. It's 11.40 on Wall Street. I'm Nathan Hager. We check the markets for you all day long here on Bloomberg as we continue to watch stocks slide and treasuries advance. The uh, idea of overblown valuations and signs of stretched positioning in the market running up against uh, what many saw as a confusing message last week from Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell. Investors are going to be waiting to see if he clarifies that, uh, where the path for interest rates could be going when he begins two days of testimony on Capitol Hill tomorrow. We spoke moments ago with Danielle DiMartino Booth. She's the CEO of Quill Intelligence and a former advisor to the president of the Dallas Federal Reserve Bank. To say that it's exceedingly rare to see the Fed truly pause and then resume rate hikes, I will believe it when I see it, and I'm happy to be corrected. And that's what the market is pricing in right now. But this is a highly unusual situation. Uh, But again, markets are sitting at about 74% probability that there's another go come July, but there's a heck of a lot of data between now and then. And right now, the S&P 500 is trading lower, down 30 points or 7 tenths of 1%. The Dow is down 314 or 9 tenths of 1%. And the NASDAQ is lower by 82 points. That is a drop of 6 tenths of 1%. Of the 11 main industry groups in the S&P 500, the only one in the green right now is consumer discretionary, and that's just by 1 tenth of 1% higher. Ten-year Treasury is up 12 30 seconds for a yield of 3.71%. The two-year yield, 468 NYMEX crude is down about two and a quarter percent or $1.61 at $70.17 a barrel. COMEX gold is down one and a quarter percent or $24.60 at $19.46.60 an ounce. The euro is at 1.0904 against the dollar. The yen at 141.37. Spotify is planning a more expensive subscription tier in a bid to satisfy investors who think the uh, podcast developer should raise its prices. Sources tell Bloomberg News they're calling it Sue Premium internally, and we're told it'll include a a high-fidelity audio option and expanded access to audio books. Right now, investors don't seem mollified. Spotify shares are lower by 2.5%. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash, and Bloomberg Markets continues with Paul Sweeney and Jess Menton. All right, Nathan Hager, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Jess Men and Paul Sweeney here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Jess, I'm looking at the SPX, and I put it up there, and I use the RSI function, Relative Strength Index. And it's got this little chart at the bottom, and it kind of shows you when the, it's overbought. overbought or oversold. Right. And, you know, we're right at that overbought. Right above 70. Yeah, right above 70. It starts to get, get, gets you to wonder here, and I know a lot of people are concerned about that broadly defined. Let's check in with somebody who uh, you know does this for a living, Phil Palumbo. He's the founder, CEO, and CIO of Palumbo Wealth Management. Phil, thanks for joining us. Are, are you concerned that this market might be overbought right here? Absolutely. I think that's number, number, my number one reason why I'm cautious in the short term, but more optimistic in the long term. So looking at sentiment and some overbought indicators, the RSI is one of them. There's no doubt in my mind, in the short term, the market is way oversold, so- way overbought. What are you telling investors as far as positioning at this point? So I'm cautious in the short term, and I and I have a lot of cash in the short term, simply for the reason of, you know, think about the Fed and what the Fed has done so far. It's not over yet. So we're still going to raise rates. And if you look at since 1989, there's a direct correlation with earnings growth and the S&P 500 returns, right? And that, that happens about 74% of the time. The other time, the other 26% of the time, when the Fed intervenes, as the Fed is doing right now, the correlation is actually negative. So this year, the forecast for earnings is pretty much flat to up 1%, 2% consensus. And you have a Fed that's still tightening. In that type of an environment, especially as, as overboard as we are now, it's very difficult to, to take on a position in, in risk assets such as equities right now. When you say cash, do you mean cash or cash equivalents? <laughs> so right now, money market funds are yielding. Ah, uh, money market funds, yeah. Five, and treasury bills are, you know, between four and a half to five, five and a quarter. So that's where we're parking cash right now. So what? where are you in terms of your cash holdings today, like percentage-wise? And, and where is that versus maybe your average? Yeah, so average, we're normally between 2 and 3%. Today, we're 15 to 18%. Wow. So, so far, coming into this year, we've been wrong. Uh, but last year, it worked really well for us. So, you know, we're patient. We're long-term investors. When you think about where the market's trading right now, the forward multiple around 19 times, you got a treasury bill around five. 
it's really tough, especially in an overbought market we have today. It's really tough to, to take a position in the market, but that doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities out there. Every single day there are opportunities where certain great businesses are trading cheap for whatever reason. So we're always on the out, we're always on the lookout for that. And you know, just because a market's overbought doesn't mean there are, there are not other opportunities out there. Money market funds have been a very hot topic among guests yep. that have been speaking to Paul and myself over the past few weeks and just in recent months in general. What is it about money market funds? Is it just as simple as being able to yield more than you could have over the last decade or so? Well, to me, it's it's a very simplistic type of investment. I mean, it's short-term pay, but within their instruments. Oftentimes, there are treasuries. It could be some repos in there, some, some short-term corporate paper as well. But, I mean, this... These type of investments, it really doesn't concern me. I mean, we work with Federated. They're one of the best money market fund managers in the world. You know, they're one of the largest. We speak to them consistently to really understand the portfolios that we're invested in. There are different types of money market fund options that you can invest in. One, Some are more aggressive than others. You know, we tend to stay on the more conservative side. This is cash. This is where we don't want to take risk. Uh, versus going into something like equities or other type of risk assets. So what's the catalyst to move that money from money market funds into equities? Yeah, so, so I said to you, and I started the conversation saying I'm cautious in the short term, but I'm more optimistic in the long term. The reason why I'm more optimistic in the long term is simply because we finally got back to a more normalized rate as it relates to the Fed fund rates, right? Five and a quarter. So now if economies do weaken, Fed has more flexibility to decrease rates, which can help create an expansion an expansionary type of economy. So I, I love that. Number two, AI. So AI is for real. It's going to it's going to create productivity for the economy, and that's here to stay. And that's going to I help I think really help build a really nice strong economy as we think about things going forward. And then three, the consumer is strong. So my whole point in just telling you that is that any type of pullback in the overall equity market, when relative strength number gets below forty, we're interested in buying into that. How much earnings risk do you think, Phil, is still in this marketplace? You mentioned that you know S and P earnings this year are kind of flattish year over year. And like some people are saying, there's still you know, more room to go down. There was more risk, actually, to those earnings. Yeah, you know, I think I think Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley and others out there are going to be wrong. I really do. I think that, if, you know, if you look at the Fed Atlanta GDP num now number, it's at 1.8, 1.9. If you got a growing GDP number, it's really tough to get earn for earnings to really get hit as bad as some of these people are saying, number one. Number two, I mean, the job market is so strong. You look at the job opening numbers. That's still very strong. You know, consumers have jobs, and they're spending money – as we can see in various ways, if you speak to business owners on the front line, and that's really the best way to get gauge what's going on out there in the economy. And I do that, you know, quite seldom in various industries. And all of them are saying that things look good. In fact, things are actually improving is what they are saying, right? So it's much different than looking at an economic indicator versus talking to people on the front lines in different industries. So I, I just think that many of them are going to be wrong. I was in that camp. I changed my tune. And, and I think that, you know, you know, we're moving in, in the right direction. Some of the economic indicators I look at are starting to bottom and, and move in the right direction. So so I think we're starting to see um, an interesting economy. Anything could happen, obviously. Time in macro is very difficult. Uh, but but overall, you know, we've, we've managed okay up to this point. Phil, what are the top questions you're getting from your clients? I mean, there's this whole lingering question about recession. Again, I was in that camp. I'm still concerned about potential recession. And, and so the biggest concern is, Phil, if we go into a recession, there's more downside to the market. What do you think about that? Right. And my answer is we can't time macro. We can't time where interest rates go and we can't figure out the economy, especially in this current environment right now. Any playbook that we're all used to has to completely be thrown out the window. COVID has created tremendous imbalances and we still have a spillover from that. So as I always tell clients, and my clients are very wealthy already, my job is to keep them wealthy. And I do that by creating a balanced, constructed portfolio. We have more cash than normal today, getting 5%. They're fine with that. And if markets do retrace from here and decline, we'll take advantage of that and buy into the stocks of great businesses that we own. All right, Phil, thanks so much for joining us. As always, appreciate getting a couple minutes of your time. Phil Palumbo, he's the founder, he's CEO and CIO, does it all at Palumbo Wealth Management, waiting for... Um, better opportunity to get into the marketplace. That was my takeaway. And also, if you look at the latest flows data from last week, money market funds saw their first outflows for the really? first time in two months. So that okay. argument about cash coming off the sidelines, beginning to see there. Somebody wrote a story about that on Friday. Oh, did they? <laughs> I'm sure, okay, I'm sure we did. I'm sure we covered it. Uh, S&P 500 <laughs> off, off about 7 tenths of 1% here. The Dow off 9 tenths of 1%, off about 300 points on the Dow Jones Industrials. Uh, NASDAQ off. Also about six tenths of one percent. Well, more coming up. This is Bloomberg. 
Let's get some company news right now with Steve Rappaport. Paul, another car maker is teaming up with Tesla for its EV charging ports. Rivian says drivers will gain access to more than 12,000 Tesla superchargers across the U.S. and Canada beginning next year. The company will also incorporate Tesla's North American charging standard port into its existing EV models from 2025 and a future model called R2. Currently, shares of Rivian are up more than 3.5%. UBS is facing hundreds of millions of dollars in regulatory fines over Credit Suisse Group's dealings with Archegos Capital. More from Bloomberg's Russell Ward. This is just one of the many cases uh, that UBS is uh, inheriting uh, following the completion of its takeover of Credit Suisse last week. Um, in the case of Archegos, we know that um, Credit Suisse has been negotiating with regulators from Switzerland, the US and the UK over what happened that led to uh, its massive losses, the five billion or more um, losses that it booked a couple of years ago uh, tied to the collapse of uh, Archegos. Credit Suisse has already uh, admitted risk management failures, failures to the Swiss regulator. FIMA. Thanks, Russell. Shares of UBS are down more than 1%. A new analysis finds Amazon will dominate yet another area of business in the coming years. According to an analyst at Morgan Stanley, he says the company is set to overtake Walmart in beauty product sales by 2025. He says Amazon will make up about 14.5% of a beauty market that could hit $180 billion in value two years from now. And more Americans are splurging on expensive timepieces. Swiss watchmakers' shipments increased in May as U.S. demand rebounded. Exports to the U.S. rose nearly 10% for the month after a decline in April.
You're listening to Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. All right, Jess Menton and Paul Sweeney here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. We are streaming on YouTube. You can go to YouTube and, I guess, search Bloomberg Global News, and that'll bring you right to us. You can see Jess and I in all, all our glory Have fun here. With us. Absolutely. Uh, markets are trading off here today. S&P off about seven-tenths of uh, 1%. And then the rate space uh, peeling off as well just a little bit. The 10-year Treasury off about five basis points. Three spots, seven, one on your 10-year, 4.69% on your two years. So still quite a bit of an inversion there. I've been told that's important, but it doesn't seem to be. I don't know. People keep kind of ignoring <laughs> it, but take. I'm going to keep calling it out until it gets pr pr proven <laughs> correct. Uh, right now, let's head down to Washington, D.C. We're going to get World and National Reserve News, and we'll do that with Amy Mars. All right, thank you, Paul. The search for a diving vessel that was headed to the wreck of the Titanic has shifted underwater. Air efforts failed to find the craft, which has five people on board and is running out of oxygen. Coast Guard Rear Admiral John Mauger says the search is challenging because of the area where the submersible went missing. The location of the search is approximately 900 miles uh, east of Cape Cod uh, in a water depth of uh, roughly 13,000 feet. It is a, a remote area, uh, and it is a, a challenge to conduct a uh, search in that remote area. Now, the Coast Guard says there was one pilot, four mission specialists on board. Those are people who pay to come along on those expeditions. The submersible is designed to have enough oxygen for five people over 96 hours, but remember, it's been missing since Sunday. A federal and state investigation is underway after authorities say more than 100 letters containing a suspicious white powdery substance were received by Kansas lawmakers and state officials. Republican State Representative Stephen Owen says when he opened his letter, he spotted that white powder and saw the envelope had a fake return address for a local church, something he says was designed to make lawmakers think it was from a constituent. They were definitely very methodical and very thoughtful. This was very intentionally meant to get lawmakers to open this letter. Kansas State Representative Stephen Owens described the experience as terrifying. President Biden meeting with artificial intelligence experts in San Francisco today. The president and tech leaders are discussing managing the risks of the rapidly advancing technology as the generative AI industry is booming, prompting questions about what the technology means for jobs and the spread of misinformation. Global News 24 hours a day powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Amy Morris and this is Bloomberg. Paul and Jess. All right, Amy Marsh, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Boy, that submarine story is... It's scary. Kind of, it's scary. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, you just showed me a video that you took in, in a little submersible down in Aruba. I, it was last month, actually, for my birthday. I was down there, and I, I did do it, but obviously not going quite down as far as something like the Titanic. Yeah, I think the only time I'm getting in a submarine is if it's a U.S. Navy submarine and it's manned by U.S. Navy personnel. I'm going to leave it to the professionals. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's definitely a scary story. So waiting for developments on this, as obviously the situation with the oxygen waning for this uh, submersible, that's uh, obviously U.S. Coast Guards are among those searching for the missing craft. But we're actually going to have a guest in our next hour who's going to talk more with us, uh, Mick Mulroy, who's the co-founder oh, yeah, of the Lobo okay. Institute, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East at the Department of Defense. She, he's going to discuss with us, obviously, the meeting between Xi Jinping and the U.S. Secretary of State, but also what's going on with this titanic tour surge right now yeah it's just uh, amazing i i, I you know from just the reporting i'm seeing it the, the depths are really challenging the terrain is really challenging and then obviously just the the limited amount of oxygen makes it very difficult but hopefully right you know a miracle can, can, can happen here so it looks like the, the company that's uh that sponsored this this trip that's re is in charge of the because they know that it's in charge of the recovery because or the search because they they know the site but the obviously the u.s coast guard is is involved as well Right, so this is going to be a big key development that we're obviously going to keep our eyes on, but we're getting close to noon here, Paul, and looking over at the S&P 500, still below 4,400, and still all 11 sectors in the S&P 500 lower. You were talking about crude oil prices being lower, obviously correlating to these declines we're seeing in energy and materials. All right, very good. We appreciate that. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, more coming up in one more minute. We're going to have uh, more Bloomberg Markets. That continues right now.
This is Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney. They got a lot of green on the screen here, but the volume is light. This is a market that's much more optimistic or bullish than maybe the central bankers are. 9.5 million job openings. What are people doing? Are they just sitting in Starbucks all day? Breaking market news and insight from Bloomberg experts. There's still some concern out there in the market that there is room for things to deteriorate a little bit more than what they're indicating. As small and medium-sized businesses struggle, they don't present as much competition. What are you guys thinking about hardware, software? How should investors approach this thing called AI. This is Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. All right, coming up in this hour, we're going to check in with George Ferguson. He's a senior aerospace and defense analyst uh, for Bloomberg Intelligence. He's over at the Paris Air Show, which is just the boondoggle of boondoggles. But he goes, it's every other year in Paris, and then the other year it's London. And that's where they buy and sell fleets of airplanes, I think. So that's, it's a Can't big wait. deal. Big money <laughs> trades happen over there. So he's over there. We'll get the latest there. Plus, Brianne Lynch, she's head of market insight at Equity Zen. Talk about the IPO market. Uh, there was actually a good deal uh, last week, uh, Kava IPO. So we'll get the latest there. Uh, and then, as you mentioned before, uh, we're going to check in with Mick Mul Mulroy and talk about uh, China as well as the latest on the Titanic. But first, uh, let's go to Charlie Pella for a Bloomberg Business Flash. Hi. Thank you very much, Paul Sweeney. We are looking at a down Tuesday here. Here with the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ all declining. Stocks lower as the second quarter rally met resistance from economic headwinds and signs of stretch positioning. Treasuries advanced. Right now we've got the 10-year yielding 3.71%, with the two-year at 4.69%. The S&P lower by 31 points, down by about 7 tenths of 1%. Dow Industrials down 305 right now at 33,994, a drop now of 9 tenths of 1%. NASDAQ Composite Index down 92, that is a drop of 7 tenths of 1%. NASDAQ 100 Index down now by six tenths of one percent spot gold is down by about eight tenths of one percent lower by fifteen dollars to nineteen thirty five west texas intermediate crude holding just above seventy dollars a barrel down two point two percent right now seventy dollars and twenty one cents fedex will be among the names reporting after the close of trading today fedex shares down now by about one point two percent eli Lilly is paying about two point four billion dollars to acquire dice therapeutics that's a biotech Technology company that is developing oral treatments for immune diseases. Lilly shares, they're up by seven tenths of one percent, but Dice shares, they're rolling higher right now by 37.2 percent. So again, recapping equities lower, S&P down now by 31 points, a drop of seven tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Charlie Pellet, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Jess, I don't know about you. I'm on the Apple three trillion watch. I mean, yes. two point nine one trillion. It's one hundred eighty five bucks today. It needs to get to like one hundred ninety, one hundred ninety one, somewhere in that range to hit three trillion. That would be pretty big. It would. <laughs> and I mean, all of us, I feel like, are on that three trillion watch for Apple. Yeah, it's up forty two percent year to date. Obviously, so it's stock trading around records. Yeah, just extraordinary. All right, let's get a look at what's happening uh, under the hood in these markets. We welcome Bailey Lipschultz. He covers uh, all the markets for Bloomberg News. He joins us here in our Bloomberg studio here. Bailey, what are you looking at today? Yeah, all three major averages trading in the red right now. As Charlie mentioned, the big news in the healthcare sector is Eli Lilly's plan to buy immune drug developer Dice Therapeutics for $2.4 billion. Uh, that's about a 40% premium to where it had been trading all cash, continuing to be a tre uh, part of the trend that we've been seeing with large biopharma companies buying yep. some smaller companies after that FTC pushback looking at some of the data 11 buyouts in the industry announced since mid-March six of which coming since mid-May so you're seeing uh, companies putting the cash that they've been able to compile whether that's from uh, COVID vaccines COVID drugs or like Lilly where you just have a number of blockbusters and building out that pipeline with some of these smaller uh, deals one thing to keep an eye on though is we aren't really seeing much strength across the biotech sector. So the XBI, which is normally tracked by uh, analysts and industry vets as the ETF to keep an eye on because it's equal weighted, down about eight tenths of 1%. So not much of a read across to some of those peers. And Paul, you were talking about Apple with the $3 trillion mm -hmm. dollar yep. watch valuation there. Another one we're keeping an eye on on our team is NVIDIA getting closer to overtaking Amazon when it comes to their markets clap. So, is that right? Yeah, so take Holy a look at that on, on SPX. Look at the member weightings in there. But 
looking over at NVIDIA about uh, a little over one trillion valuation. You're looking at Amazon about Man, one point three trillion. So AI, looking right? at that. Uh, but what else are you watching, Bailey? Yeah, talking about tech, one of the things that jumps out is Alibaba down right now five percent after uh, announcements that Jack Ma's two of his longest serving lieutenants coming in to try to turn around the company, struggling to regain its footing since Beijing's uh, regulatory assault uh, against the internet sector back in 2021. So you're looking at the likes of Eddie Wu and Joe Tsai replacing eight-year uh, veteran CEO Daniel Zhang. One other ETF we keep an eye on, the FXI, large cap Chinese ETF, down to, uh, more than 4% right now. BABA is not in that, but you're seeing the weakness across yep. uh, Chinese ADRs continuing to play out just given potential regulatory concerns and valuation debate here in the U.S. All right, I got a good story for both of you. And Jess, it's by your uh, buddy, Elena Popina, yes. of your team. Goldman, uh, all right, here we go. Goldman says IPO bust looks like it's ready to boom once again. So they have a gauge of just kind of sentiment for IPO. So the gauge measures the overall environment for IPOs. It's now surged to a reading of 93 from its low of seven last September, and it's set to keep on rising, Goldman Sachs says. Uh, a level of 100 indicates the typical frequency of public debuts. So they're saying, you know, some of the macro stuff out there might be pointing right. to some, you know, a pickup in the IPO market, which would be good for the market and for the Bailey Lipschultz. Yeah, who, <laughs> Bailey, who did cover for our ECM Watch column, did cover Kava last week, actually, in its IPO. Yeah, that was exciting. I mean, it was a smaller deal, only $318 million raise, but it's not often you've seen uh, stock double with underwriters like J.P. Morgan. There were legitimate right. banks underwriting it, which we haven't seen a lot of activity other than Kennedy so far this year. And that, that the Kava one kind of got, I think, me by surprise. I got, a, I think, a lot of restaurant investors by surprise by the valuation that it's currently trading at. It was, it was priced from what we heard from um, Michael Halen of Bloomberg Intelligence at a pretty rich multiple at the IPO price itself. Um, that he was urging some some caution there, but then the stock you know like doubles on the first print. So you know like oh boy, so much for the valuation. Right. Close call. to a five billion dollar valuation. Yeah. Well, the big thing is you're, it's trading in and holding in well right now. So right now it's trading around thirty eight bucks. That IPO price at twenty two, and that's the big thing that ECM investors and bankers are focused on. Are these deals popping and actually holding on to those gains as opposed to you know seeing it double and then. A month later, it's back below its IPO price. So right now, still markedly higher. And this is all in the wake of Kenview, the uh, J&J consumer health spin-out, which also raised yep. uh, more than $4 billion right now, still up almost 20% from that IPO. What is the, what Kava? Then that's a holding. They own a bunch of restaurants. I don't even know which restaurant brands they own. It's a fast casual Mediterranean. Fast chain. casual. There's actually Med some or in Manhattan, kind of close to where we is are. It, we should all go on a trip. And, and what's, is it? Is the name Kava? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Kava, and then they own Zoe's Kitchen. That was a company they bought. So that's like they're re working on rebranding that. But Kava is essentially the Mediterranean Chipotle, and they also do sell things like dips and wraps at Whole Foods and other companies. So kind of a bit of an interesting business, but it is funny when you look at comparable companies that it's larger than, as you mentioned, Paul, over $4 billion valuation that's bigger than the likes of Shake Shack, that's more than double the size of Sweetgreen, which obviously a few years ago was one of those big debuts, uh, just a little bit smaller than Wendy's. So it's still really? a okay. big wow. company, big. and they don't have that many stores. I just went to Shake Shack for the first time a couple weeks ago. First Hadn't time? Been. But I went to one in Wash, what was it, uh, Madison Square Park. I feel like when it comes to burgers yeah. and shakes, it's very, uh, just so many rivals throughout the country, depending right. on where you're from. Right. Bailey, are you from California? California, in and so out. So in and out, in and out this is like say. far and above. Yes, I agree. I'm, Texas I'm a big is in and out. what a burger. Now, <laughs> what a burger. <laughs> yes. We don't have them around here, do we? No, it's mostly in the South. Okay. But yeah, the in and out, I don't know why In N Out Burger hasn't ventured more. Like, why we don't have them here, for example? They're all owned by the family, and they pick where they launch. Uh, that's it. kind of like how it yeah. is for Whataburger. Well, I mean, here I'll just, and then we'll get to back to business, but I go to the one in Monterey, California, and there's not one, I mean, it's packed. And the line, <laughs> the cars down the street, it's just, it's a disaster. Why not put another one there, but they I, don't, I which have, I guess is a part of the magic. Well, that, I have three within maybe a 10-mile radius where <laughs> my parents live, and no matter what, it's always a line out the door. You're waiting at least a half hour for food, no matter what happens. Yep. All right. It's a good what, stuff. What was your verdict, Paul? Oh, uh, two thumbs up on yeah, both In-N-Out and, and Shake Shack was good, too. So, uh, Which one's better, though? 
Um, yeah, that's what we need to know. I go in and out burger. I think. Yeah. Ooh, I, there I, I we go. So. I think so. But they're they're both good. I'll, I'll challenge them any any time. Uh, <laughs> Bailey, thanks so much for joining us. Bailey Lipschultz uh, giving us the uh, hamburger reporter. update there. We appreciate that. <laughs> All right, let's pivot over to Le Great Boondoggle over in Paris. That would be the Paris <laughs> Air Show. Um, they buy and sell airplanes there. Like you know, we change socks. George Ferguson's over there. He's a senior aerospace and defense analyst. And it's so important that George is there. So we send him there every other year there. And then the odd year they go to London. George, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Boeing, Airbus, how's it playing out for those two big uh, aerospace companies? Uh, thanks for having me. It's, uh, I'd, say it's, I'd say it's playing out kind of weekly this, um, this year. Weekly as in W-E-A-K-L. <laughs> I think there's no E in there. Why? Um, you know, we've seen uh, a lot of the orders we've seen are really uh, wheels out of previous orders that were undisclosed, and so they, they disclose them at the air show, and, you know, they try to get someone to put them in the tally. Um, Airbus started the show out with a 500 uh, airplane order from Indigo, the largest order ever, which it was that was pretty exciting. But, I mean, when you, when you look at the order books right now, Indigo, uh, you know, the, the largest airline in India, fast grower, Indigo has 400 airplanes on order already, so I guess they'll add the 500 to that. 400 wow. have about 900 airplanes on order. They said they're taking care of in the order book well into the next decade, it, it, which didn't surprise us. They took about 50 airplanes last year, so uh, I think they were looking to make a big splash. But, uh, you know, if you knock that order out, there's just not a, not a lot going on at the show. But don't tell my bosses because I want to come back next year. <laughs> what do these orders tell us about the trajectory of the global economy? You know, I, I think what they tell us is, uh, and look, aerospace is one of the the last recovering areas of the global economy. And everyone we talk to over here, we ask the same question: How's your supply chain? How's your supply chain? How's your supply chain? And we're hearing stories from um, it's it's not getting any worse, but it isn't. But st we still have a lot of problems. So we're getting you know incremental improvement. This industry isn't performing at the level it was performing before the pandemic. It's going to take them a bunch more years to get there. And so what that means is the backlogs are already large. They're already stretching into the next decade, especially for the, the Neo and the Max, right, the two narrow-body people movers. Um, and so I think you don't wait for the show if you had an order to place. You got it placed right away because you had to get in that backlog and hope that these uh, two uh, manufacturers figure out how to get more airplanes pumped through their factories. But they're still... So having supply chain problems, labor's the big issue. So, all right, I want to get to it. Like, what, what is the problem? I'm not hearing about semiconductor problems anywhere these days. I, you know, it feels I haven't heard from the auto guys in, in a while. So what really for, for aerospace? I, I understand it's long lead time and it's, you know, building the planes, a pretty big deal. But what are the supply chains and, and kind of is there any fix out there? You know, it's really hard, I think, for aerospace because, the, like I said, the big problem is labor, labor, mm. labor. And it's not just hiring labor, right? This is sophisticated manufacturing. You have to hire it, train it, and get it to perform at the level it performed pre-pandemic. All of this in the backdrop of, an, of a global economy where during the pandemic people learned to work from home, liked it, yep. want the quality of life. And so now you, you say to yourself, do I want to go back to my aerospace job? i got to go there five days a week. My neighbor's going in three days a week and he's <laughs> sleeping in at 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm not taking that job. I'm going to go into tech or something like that. Wow. So especially when it comes to pilot pay, that has been a particular issue, right? Yeah, yes, absolutely. The funny thing, too, is the pilots, even in their agreement, they wanted quality of life issues, and I was like, "Wow, or you gotta you gotta get in the cockpit and fly the plane." But uh, U.S. pilots, especially, uh, I, guess, I think are gonna have a really good year, right? Delta has already signed an agreement with their pilots, eighteen percent immediately, retroactive to the beginning of the year, five more percent uh, in pay at the end of the year, and then I think it's another five, four, and four in the out years. Um, so if you want the school to be a pilot, you, yep. you know, your ship has come in. <laughs> your ship has come in. So, George, <laughs> over there in Paris, I know it's always a fight and you know, between Boeing and, and Airbus. But I, I want to talk about kind of talk about the, the big jets that I like, the big wide body jets, you know, the old 747s or even the, 
you know, the triple sevens and all that kind of stuff, the, uh, the Airbus 3, I don't know, was it 380, this monster? Are they even going to be making yeah. those things anymore? Or is it all, like you said, the people movers, the, the smaller planes? You know, so what we saw during the pandemic is that the big four-engine uh, airplanes, 380 and the 747, they were sunset. So um, they're done with the 74. I think we're fully done with the 380. There might be one or two coming off the line still, but they're done. Um, the two big the wide bodies that are going to rule the day, I think, you know, post-pandemic, are going to be the 787 and the A350. And we've seen orders for those airplanes here at the show. Long-haul travel has taken a little bit longer to come back. Uh, China is still not sort of wide open. There's not much capacity going in and out of there from Europe and the U.S., um, you know, long-haul capacity. So that's kind of slowed down that recovery. I still think there's some wheeling to dealing, dealing to do here at the show on wide bodies because that's one of the areas of the backlogs, the, you know, the 350 and the 787 that Boeing and Airbus would like to grow. They want to build, um, they want to build more rate on that. They can make, they can be more profitable if they build more per month. And so I think there's probably some wheeling and dealing to be done. Maybe last minute dinners tonight, you know, to try to coerce people to buy $130 million jets, you know. All right. You flew over to Paris. I'm guessing you went business. How was it in terms of was it sold out? Tell, tell us about the flight and kind of what you learned. Yeah, I mean, uh, flight was uh, pretty full. It was a United flight on a 777, that big steel that, that you like. Yep. And those will continue to remain in, in, uh, um, you know, in production. I think their heyday, that, they will come back and have a heyday again because they'll be the biggest people movers. But, but the, the, the flight was full. Um, you know, I think this year is going to be uh, pretty busy uh, when it comes to this summer, when it comes to uh, European travel, there's a lot of bounce back. Uh, you know, here in Paris, we have you can see a lot of Americans on the streets. Not, not a lot of uh, Asians. You know, not a lot of Chinese and Koreans and J- Japanese from other times I've been here. A lot, a lot more Americans, a dollar strong. Uh, so they're filling airplanes, and they're all, you know, they're trying to get that revenge travel, and they got to go back to Paris two or three more times since they had to go through a pandemic, and so they're, you know, they're full. They're in the airplanes. George, we only have 30 seconds left. When do you think corporate travel will return to its pre-pandemic levels? Yeah, so our last look, it was 70% back. I think we uh, got to get back to a world where people are going to the office five days a week, and it's uh, maybe not so much quality of life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's coming from a former Army <laughs> officer. You know, Quality of life, get back to work. Um, George Ferguson, thank you so much. We appreciate it, as always. George Ferguson, he covers the global aerospace industry, the airline business. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, he is a, a veteran of the U.S. Army, so we, uh, of course, thank him for his service. But again, you know, when I was working with George, I'd see this request come in. Oh, I got to go to Paris for the Paris Air Show, or next year I need to yeah. go to London for the farms. But I'm like, really? You got to go? He says, yeah, this is where it all happens. You know, and then where, here he, there he is. Yeah, I mean, and, <laughs> I mean, it they just, it's amazing the, the, you know, the amount of money that gets committed uh, at those air shows. Uh, just huge orders from uh, airlines. And he was mentioning Indigo, uh, talking about a fast growth market uh, of India. So that's interesting to, to learn. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's get some company news right now with Steve Rappaport. Paul, one of the world's biggest music streaming services, plans to start a new premium tier. Bloomberg's Tom Busby reports. Spotify now planning to launch a more costly subscription option dubbed internally as Sue Premium, which is expected to have high fidelity audio and be its most expensive tier yet. Now, Spotify has been working on this new hi-fi tech for about two years, but delayed its rollout after Apple Music and Amazon Music began offering the feature for free part of their standard plans. Now, this new service expected to drive more revenue and appease investors who have been prodding the Swedish-based company to raise the price of its premium plan service, which has remained at $9.99 a month since it was introduced several years ago. Thanks, Tom. Shares of Dice Therapeutics are up more than 37% after Eli Lilly agreed to acquire the company for about $2.4 billion. More from Bloomberg's Jeff Bellinger. Steve, Eli Lilly agreed to pay $48 per share in cash for the biotech company that is developing oral treatment for immune diseases. That amount is a 42% premium above Dice's closing share price on Friday. The transaction is expected to close in the third quarter. Big drug makers have been shopping for biotechnology firms with immune therapies that can fill a variety of patient needs and conditions such as psoriasis. Oral drugs are often preferred to injectables which can be expensive to make and store and sometimes require complex administration. 
Steve? Thanks, Jeff. Despite tech layoffs and high inflation, the biggest companies paid their workers more for the second straight year. According to an analysis by the Wall Street Journal, most S&P 500 companies said their median worker was paid more in 2022. Headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business app. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. It's 12:21 on Wall Street. We do check markets all day long at Bloomberg. A rally reality check for the U.S. stock market. We're off session lows, but still a lot of red on the screen with the Dow, the S&P, and Nasdaq all declining. The second quarter rally meeting resistance from economic headwinds and signs of stretched positioning. S&P 500 index down 25 points, a drop now of six tenths of one percent. The Dow is down 265, a decline of just about eight tenths of one percent. While Nasdaq is down 59, a decline of four tenths of one percent. Ten-year yield 3.71 percent, with a two-year now 4.67 percent. Spot gold down 13 dollars the ounce to 1937, a decline of seven tenths of one percent and west texas intermediate crude down 2.2 percent 7021 for a barrel of wti aviation executives have gathered for a second day at the paris air show it is the first time the event taking place outside of the french capital in four years george ferguson is with bloomberg intelligence he was interviewed moments ago right here on bloomberg markets a lot of the orders we've seen are really uh, wheeled out of previous orders that were undisclosed, and so they, they disclosed them at the air show, and you know they try to get someone to put them in the tally. Um, Airbus started the show out with a 500 uh, airplane order from Indigo, the largest order ever, which it was that was pretty exciting. And again, recapping U.S. markets, we are trading lower. The Dow, the S&P, Nasdaq, all in the red right now. Among the names to be reporting after the close of trading today, we'll be hearing from FedEx. That stock down now by just about 1%. So again, recapping, red on the screen here with the S&P 500 index down 25 points, a drop of six-tenths of 1%. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Thank you, Charlie. Jess Mitten and Paul Sweeney here in the Interactive Broker Studio. And Paul and I, we were just talking about that Kava IPO yep. last week that debuted. It actually ended up being the sixth largest IPO of the year after it raised $317 million at around a 200, actually a $2.5 billion valuation. But once you saw that open up, Paul, obviously closer to a $5 billion uh, valuation and, and ended up being up to about $42 uh, per share. Now it's trading around 38 But who better to bring in to chat about this IPO as well as what the outlook is when it comes to the 
IPO market. Uh, Brian Lynch, who's the head of market insight at Equity Zen. Brian, talk to us about this IPO last week and what you think this means as far as what the trajectory is for the IPO market moving forward this year, next year. Thanks for having me. Um, I think the IPO market was really seeing the benefits of the Mediterranean diet. As you've said, the Kava IPO traded up 92% on its first day and holding on to that IPO pop. And I think they've set a really strong example for what a company needs to show to have a successful IPO. So public market investors are looking for companies generating significant revenue, so Kava generating over 500 million, and then also a mix of growth and profitability. So they stated how the majority of their IPO proceeds would go to opening more stores, and while they're not profitable, they have strong unit economics, and they're on a near-term path to that. So they've kind of laid out the path for the boxes other companies will need to check as well. So, uh, Brianna, I mean, you know, the S&P 500 is up you know, a, a good chunk this year, 10, 11, 12%. Why haven't we seen more deals? Because the deals we've seen, Kenview, Kava, have been wildly successful. And I, there's got to be a, a, you know, a, a, a backlog that, you know, is incredibly huge now for most of these underwriters, I would think. Yeah, absolutely. You have globally over 1,200 unicorn companies. So these are private companies valued at over a billion dollars many that are sitting on the sidelines and we're waiting for the market to turn around. So while the market's down a bit today, the s and is at a 14-month high, the VIX is at its lowest level since February of 2020. And as you said, we've seen a few successful IPOs. So I think companies who have strong business fundamentals and have put the right hires in place uh, really should start to think about capitalizing on this market opportunity. And Paul and I were actually just talking about a story Alina Papina did on our U.S. equities team about how Goldman Sachs was saying the IPO bus looks like it's ready to boom once again, looking at that data. Do you think that is, when you're seeing a call like that from Goldman Sachs, that you'll see more firms kind of jump in and join that kind of call? I think it's certainly encouraging, and there's a lot of pent-up demand both for liquidity from early employees and shareholders of these companies who have been waiting 10, 15 years for an IPO, uh, but then also for investor access. I think there is this desire to participate in innovation and growth and with companies staying private longer, that's happening in the private market. So once these growing companies do make their public market debut, I think they will be warm received, will be received warmly. Um, so I would say that like the Goldman report is painting the right picture. So the last 18 months have been the slowest initial public offering market really since a great financial crisis. Um, I guess I'm just wondering what the catalyst is going to be here. Um, uh, Brienne, because it, it it feels like, you know, just by judging by recent deals, I'd be hitting a market right here. I'm not sure why pe people are waiting. We're starting to see more companies confidentially file or, you know, make the indications that they're preparing for an IPO. So maybe hiring a new head of investor relations, hiring a new CFO. Um, but there are companies, you know, who are in the process that I think public market investors will be excited about. Arm is one. This is the British SoftBank backed mm. microchip company uh, that tried to merge with NVIDIA last year. Um, that didn't work out for regulatory reasons, uh, but they were looking at a $40 billion valuation at that time. And they've confidentially filed for a US IPO. They're looking to raise eight to 10 billion. So I think that's an exciting one that we'll see coming down the pipe at some point this year. Um, and more of these examples will kind of, you know, give that nudge to additional companies to test the markets. To Paul's point, talking about the IPO market, especially last year, it was facing its worst year in about two decades, just given the backdrop of inflation and then higher interest rates. How does the Federal Reserve and their interest rate path play into this as far as if they're getting close to this peak point here, what that means for the trajectory of the IPO market? Yeah, we saw that rate increases have slowed down. So I think that's a positive. It's showing that inflation um, is getting a bit more under control. Um, and I, there will be likely future rate hikes, um, but there's a little less uncertainty around that. Um, but I think it really uh, beckons to the point of investor interest in growth. So they want, uh, you know, large 
growth opportunities um, and the ability to really capitalize on greater returns, um, you know, in a higher interest rate environment where your cash could be making more. So, uh, Brenda, are, are there any industries that the market might be more receptive to right now? Because I'm just thinking Kava was a restaurant business. Uh, Kenview was healthcare. Um, the, I mean, these aren't like the, the super sexiest things like technology or something. <laughs> so what, what are you hearing from the bankers in terms of what industries might be, you know, most receptive of, by, by the public? Yeah. So in the private markets, we're seeing a few sectors with the greatest investor interest. Uh, those are AI and machine learning companies, yep. not surprisingly. Uh, FinTech is generating a lot of interest. And then software as a service businesses as well. So those are some categories to think about um, where there may be public market interest as well uh, for the right candidates to go public. But that's what we're seeing in the private markets at Equity Zen. What are the next IPOs that are on your radar? Yeah, Arm is one I mentioned um, that I think could be interesting. Uh, Sheen is another one, the Chinese fast fashion retailer. Uh, they just raised uh, more capital at a down round just earlier this year uh, after raising at, uh, you know, a very aggressive $100 billion valuation back in April of 2021. Uh, but this is a profitable, fast-growing company. Um, with a global market that has said that they're looking to IPO later this year. So I think that's another one people will have their eye on. You, know, you bring up a good point here, um, just wondering about the types of names that could come public here. And valuation's a, a, a big issue here because I can, I can imagine me being an IPO banker going in with a valuation that would represent a down round for a lot of these companies. And that's a problem. So I, I, are we seeing that in the market? I think it's just a reality of where we are, where companies raised capital at these aggressive valuations in 2020 and 2021. And on Equity Zen's platform, we're seeing the average company trading at a 40 to 50 percent uh, discount to that last primary round, reflecting or reflecting that correction in the market. Um, so I think some companies may choose to raise additional primary capital as a means of also resetting their valuation before they go to IPO. Um, others may rip off the Band-Aid and understand that they may be, uh, you know, raising at a lower valuation in an IPO. Uh, so it, it's different paths that different companies will take. Um, but I think ultimately they need to come up with a solution, um, you know, both for liquidity and broader access. Hey, Brianne, thanks so much uh, for joining us. Really appreciate getting a few minutes of your time. Brianne Lynch, head of market insight at, at Equity Zen. And Brianne brought up a, an answer to my earlier question, which is, why aren't there more deals? And I think the answer to that, now that I think about it, is this valuation issue. Right. Because, um, you know, you'd go in there, and I can, I've can i pitched a million IPOs in my day. <laughs> I can't imagine going there and pitching a down valuation. You right. Know, that well, would not be well received. Does this compare to any other time during your career? Uh, the dot-com bubble, absolutely. I mean, the valuations were cut by 70%, 80% for a lot of these companies. Um, and it took a decade wow. for the NASDAQ to recover its, right. its valuation from yeah. the peak. So um, that is tough. And uh, so I'm not sure if we're anywhere near that. Um, but again, that could be an issue as you think about kind of this IPO market, and we got to get Bailey Lipschultz back and right, forth. Right, get you know, him here. Give, give, give him <laughs> something to do. All right, let's head down to uh, Washington, D.C. right now. We'll get World of National News with Nancy Lyons. Thanks, Paul. President Biden's son, Hunter, will plead guilty to tax and gun charges. That's according to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Delaware. The son of President Biden will plead guilty to two tax crimes and a weapons charge. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines with details. We do understand, according to a court filing, that he will plead guilty to two misdemeanor charges related to those tax violations, not paying his taxes on time. But under this deal, he would not avoid prosecution on the separate gun charge, which was an allegation that he had lied about his drug use when purchasing a handgun. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines. House Republicans say Hunter was handed a sweetheart deal, and they say they will continue to investigate business dealings by the Bidens. The judge overseeing the classified documents case against former President Trump has set an August 14th trial date. U.S. District Judge Aileen Cannon's decision, though, is not set in stone. Lawyers for the former president could file motions asking to dismiss the indictment or challenging the use of certain categories of evidence, which would require more time to litigate before any trial. 
Well, the top clock is ticking for the five people aboard a missing submersive diving vessel. They were heading to the Titanic shipwreck when it lost contact with the command ship. Chris Perry is a retired U.K. Navy rear admiral and says it's a daunting task to find it. It's a very difficult operation. Um, the actual nature of the seabed uh, is uh, uh, very undulating. Titanic herself lies uh, in, in a trench. There's lots of debris around. Uh, so trying to differentiate with sonar in particular uh, and trying to target the area you want to search in uh, with another submersible is going to be very difficult indeed. Perry says it's still unclear what exactly happened. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. This is Bloomberg.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business app. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. are well off session lows right now. The Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ all in the red with the S&P 500 index down 17 at 43.92, a drop right now of four tenths of one percent. Second quarter rally being met with skepticism as investors turn bearish ahead of Fed Chair Jay Powell's testimony later in the week. The Dow right now down 207, drop there of just about six tenths of one percent. The Dow at 34,093. NASDAQ lower now by 21 points. That is a decline of two tenths of one percent. Ten-year yield, 3.70 percent with a two-year, 4.67 percent. Gold down $13 the ounce to 1936, a drop there of seven tenths of one percent. And West Texas Intermediate Crude down 2.2 percent, $70.21 a barrel. Well, tomorrow, Fed Chair Jay Powell will begin the first of two days of testimony on Capitol Hill. Dean Kernett is the CEO and founder of Macro Risk Advisors, and he was our guest on Bloomberg Surveillance. You're getting to this point where the Fed has applied the medicine. Uh, the market feels like the Fed cycle is reasonably close to an end. If you look at the, the Bloomberg WIRP page, you know, you might squeeze out one more, uh, but it's probably not going to be much more than that. And of course, then the cuts have also come out of the market. And you can hear more of that conversation on the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. You can download it wherever you get your podcasts. Rivian Automotive shares up now by 4.6%. Rivian will incorporate Tesla's electric vehicle charging ports into future automobiles and gain access to Tesla's supercharger network. Tesla shares, they're up today by another 3%. Again, recapping, stocks are lower. The Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ all in the red. S&P down now by 15 points, a drop of four-tenths of one percent. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Charlie Pellet, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Lots going on in terms of global uh, geopolitics, if you will. M Mick Mulroy joins us. He's co-founder of the Lobo Institute, uh, former senior fellow at Middle East Initiative, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for the Middle East at the U.S. Department of Defense, uh, and also he is a uh, former U.S. Marine Infantry Officer, so we thank him for his service. Uh, hey, Mick, there's a lot to talk about here. We, we appreciate getting some more of your time. Let's start with China and Secretary of State Blinken. How would you kind of characterize that visit, the success or, or, or lack thereof? So great to be with you. I think uh, right now we can say it's somewhere in between. Um, it's good that it happened. Uh, it's important that the superpowers of the world, particularly those with nuclear weapons, are talking and not uh, and not uh, going more toward the potential for a conflict. Uh, but one of the main things that we wanted to do here was to get military to military communications uh, back started. That's something that during the entirety of the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union did, uh, mostly because we wanted to avoid a, a misinterpretation that led to an engagement that could lead to a conflict. So that's why I think Secretary Blinken has been so emphatic about that, and it looks like that did not happen. But they did have agreements to carry on and have another engagement between the foreign minister and our Secretary of State and potentially have our presidents meet at, say, the G20. Uh, so it, it wasn't a failure, but it wasn't what we needed, which was to make sure that our militaries uh, have the ability to talk to one another to avoid an escalation that either country would want. Mick, there were reports earlier this year that the U.S. was planning to increase the number of U.S. troops training Taiwanese forces, uh, not confirmed, though, obviously, by the government. Have we gotten a in new indication on that front from his visit this week? So it, one of the things that I think has irritated China so much is that we have new agreements with the Philippines, for example, to put four new uh, or four bases where U.S. military will be, uh, what the Marine Corps is doing with the Littoral Regiment, and now, to your point, that we are actively increasing the number of trainers in Taiwan. Um, that is in our interest. It's in the interest of our allies in the region, uh, but it's obviously something that, that China doesn't want to see if they still have a design on uh, taking Taiwan. Uh, so that's going to be a tension. I don't think 
we can have a hundred uh, diplomatic engagements, and we're never going to see eye to eye on the issue of Taiwan. Uh, but it is something that we need to address, and and then focus on the areas where the United States and China do have an interest, which is largely economics. Our our economies are tied. I'm not an economist, but I think I know I can say that. And it's important that we focus on those areas, understanding that there's certain areas that we'll never agree on. All right, Mick, let's uh, switch gears because I know we can do that with you. Uh, Ukraine, I guess I guess the counter offensive is, is underway. If it is, kind of how would you characterize it and what are your thoughts given that situation over there? So I would, I would characterize it as smart from the Ukrainian perspective. Um, they could have uh, they could have gone all in, uh, and they could have had a cat- catastrophic failure. What I think they've done is they've probed the Russian line. They've retaken some territory, I think around 114 uh, square kilometers right now, about eight, eight towns. Uh, but they haven't committed the bulk, the mass of their force, because they're really trying to find out where the Russians are most vulnerable and then exploit it to a point where it puts them so much on their back foot that they can start regaining uh, a lot of territory. So I think it is going where the Ukrainians expected it to, maybe not what everybody expected it would be a a more massive uh, attack, uh, acts of attack, but I think they're doing it the right way because they have have skill, they have the better equipment, but they also have a problem that they don't have as many uh, soldiers. So they have to be very... Uh, cautious on where they where they uh, uh, send those soldiers and try to find the vulnerabilities, the gaps and seams, if you will, in the Russian defenses. So I think this is going to be something that builds rather than a big big bang at the beginning. What is it going to take to get Russia out of Ukraine? It's going to be tough. Uh, I think what the Ukrainians are trying to do is get to a point where they challenge their ability to maintain their presence in Crimea something they had thought they had already gotten. They'd done it in 2014 and never thought that that would be challenged. And it is very uh, strategically important to them. If the Ukrainians can get to a point where they challenge their ability to stay there, that's why they're trying to cut off the land bridge uh, by pushing all the way through uh, Zaporizhia to be able to cut them off. The only way they can get to Crimea after that is that bridge, which is vulnerable. But if they get to that point, Perhaps there'll be a time they can negotiate. I don't know if the Ukrainians will be willing to give seed any territory, including Crimea, but Russia might get to a point where they realize that they might lose Crimea, something they never thought would happen when they launched this invasion. Mick, how important or critical are fighter jets for Ukraine? Are they a game changer or not so much? So I think they, with all the other... um, items that they've gotten, you know, from the M1 tanks, the other main battle tanks, the uh, infantry fighting vehicles. This is just one more piece of the puzzle that's going to give them the ability to go on the offensive and to the point where they can uh, take back key terrain. F-16s, they're good in the air. They can they can knock um, incoming missiles. They can knock enemy fighters, but they can also do close air support, and that's something desperately needed when you're trying to attack fortified positions in which the Russians have been in for so long uh, developing. So game changer, close to it. Uh, but I think the game changers of all the things that we've, we've given recently that are really giving them the ability to do this counteroffensive in a way that could be really meaningful, that really put Russia in a position where they might not be able to stay uh, stay in the, in, the, in the positions that they had occupied for so long. Mick, we only have about 30 seconds left, but have to get your take about this Titanic vessel. What, what do you think is going to happen there? Well, I certainly hope that we can get out and find these individuals and rescue them. It's obviously, you know, thoughts in, uh, to the, them and their family, uh, but it's going to be difficult. I mean, they, they're going to have to find, uh, if you think about it, look how long it took to find the Titanic itself. Well, the Titanic is 900 feet long. How long is the Titan? That's the name of the submersible end. It's 20 feet long. So they're going to have to figure out where it was, which is difficult because it doesn't have any communication. And then they're going to have to get all the way down there and figure out how to tether it to another submersible and bring it to the surface. Let's hope they can do it. Um, But it is not going to be easy. It's going to be a challenge. All right, Mick, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Mick Mulroy, co-founder of the Lobo Institute, uh, getting his thoughts on some geopolitical issues. This is Bloomberg. 
get some company news right now with Steve Rappaport. Baker joins Ford and General Motors in striking a deal with Tesla for access to its network of EV chargers, Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow reports. Rivian signing an agreement with Tesla that A, would see them adopt the North American charging standard or NACS standard in production models of their current generation R1 T1S and then future generations of the R2 from 2025. In the interim, Rivian drivers will have to use an adapter, but they will have access to the Tesla supercharger network in North America, around 12,000 superchargers. Thanks, Ed. And back to Ford and GM for a moment. The bipartisan group of four U.S. lawmakers will travel to Detroit today to press the chief executives of both companies to cut their supply chain reliance on China, especially when it comes to electric vehicle batteries. The four lawmakers all sit on a newly formed House of Representatives China Select Committee. Bloomberg data shows that Chinese firms account for more than half of the EV battery market and satisfy as much as 90 percent of demand for some battery materials. The Utah Jazz become the latest sports franchise to cut the cable TV cord. Starting next season, the basketball team's games will appear on a local TV station owned by Sinclair Broadcasting. Jazz games will also appear on a new paid streaming service. And FedEx investors are bracing for a big hit when the company rep reports quarterly earnings coming up today after the bell. Earnings are expected to drop 29% from the fiscal growth fourth quarter period from a year ago, although, as Bloomberg Kaylee Lines noted earlier, FedEx has beaten estimates before, topping expectations. Those are the company's stories we're following this hour. I'm Steve Rappaport, and this is Bloomberg.
You're listening to Bloomberg Markets with Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. All right, Jess Men and Paul Sweeney here in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Bloomberg Markets, it is now streaming live on YouTube. How about that? You can go Join to YouTube. Us. Yep, <laughs> just go there to YouTube and uh, search on Bloomberg Global News, and that'll get you to where we are. Uh, S&P 500 uh, coming back a little bit here. Market's kind of bouncing a little bit here off about three-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Right now, let's head down to Washington, D.C. Uh, we'll get world and national news, and we will do that with Nancy Lyons. Thanks, Paul. Hunter Biden has reached a plea deal with the Justice Department. The agreement has him admitting to tax and gun violations. If a judge okays the deal, it would mean the president's son would likely avoid jail time. Loyola Law Professor Jessica Levinson says today's development does not mean, however, that Republicans will let go of their investigations. I don't think it will quiet the critics, and I think that we will continue to see the House will hold hearings that there will additionally be investigations into Hunter Biden. Loyola Law Professor Jessica Levinson, the lead U.S. attorney on the Hunter Biden investigation, was originally appointed by former President Trump and has stayed on through the Biden administration. The president's aides say President Biden has respected the independence of the Justice Department and has not been involved. Special counsel Jack Smith requested a speedy trial for former President Trump on his alleged mishandling of classified documents, and it looks like he may get it. Judge Aileen Cannon today set August 14th as the trial date, although that could be pushed back if motions are filed by defense attorneys in the case. Well, the Coast Guard is racing against time to find a submersible, submersible diving vessel that went missing in the North Atlantic. We get the latest from Bloomberg's Amy Morris. The Titan is carrying five people on an expedition to view the Titanic shipwreck. It has a life support system that can sustain a five-person crew for 96 hours. The command ship told the Coast Guard on Sunday it lost contact with the Titan about 900 miles east of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Those on board include Action Aviation Chair Hamish Harding and Grove Vice Chair Shazana Dawood. Wood and his son, French pilot Paul Henri Gargelet, and Stockton Rush, founder and CEO of Ocean Gate, the operator of the expedition. Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. Now back to you, Paul and Jess. Hey, right, Nancy, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Rising interest rates, Jess, have been hitting everybody, individuals in our pocketbook, companies in interest, uh, higher interest expense, even private, also, in private equity companies. Right, private equity, looking at what's happening there. So this is the big take on the Bloomberg terminal for today, talking about how many buyout firms considered hedging against rising rates, a waste of time and money. <laughs> Their debt-laden companies are now paying the price. So taking a look at how if specifically when you're looking at what's happening in the private equity space, Paul. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. A lot of these you think about private equity, they load on uh, a lot of debt, uh, and that's one of the ways that they uh, generate their extraordinary returns. Um, and I guess, uh, this was kind of news to me, that you know they weren't big hedgers historically of interest rate volatility. And I asked myself, why? Well, they, had, they didn't need to. It really was a waste of money. You think about it, since a great financial crisis, rates have been so low right. for so long, and I could, I could see a whole generation of deal makers coming up and saying, what, you want me to hedge my interest rate risk? What interest rate risk? Well, right. now they're now paying it's the price. There. And looking at, particularly in the U.S., nearly three-quarters of the floating rate debt taken out during the leveraged buyout boom lacked hedges as recently as August. And that's based on some analysis from Bank of America. Yeah, it's interesting to, to see if there's going to be any, um, you know, Real, some of these deals having to be maybe be just in terms of the debt, maybe you know redone or repriced or uh, refinance it. If they're going to refinance it, obviously at much much higher rates. And so, the the big issue for the private equity uh, sponsors is that impacts obviously their right. internal rate of return, which is you know their key metric for their limited partners. This is striking. Interest rates on the largest U.S. leveraged loans hit an average of 10% this month from a close to 4% at the end of oh. 2021. It's a more than doubling there. Yeah, and when you're running your financial models, generating your you know IRRs, you didn't have that in your model, probably. Oof. You didn't have that. Definitely so we'll keep an, keep an eye on that. Uh, that's it. Bloomberg Markets down three-tenths of 1% on the S&P. How about that? Sound On with Joe Matthews starts right now.
Bitcoin ETF ring. If launched, it would be the first of its kind in the U.S. Plus, we hear from former FTX U.S. President Brett Harris, and he'll talk about his new firm, uh, Architect, as well as involvement with his former firm um, and the recent crypto pushback from the SEC. And from the lack of regulatory clarity to the latest crackdown, we'll dig into a new Bloomberg Intelligence survey taking the temperature of the industry. So all of that is ahead, but first let's take the temperature of these digital asset markets. The best way to do that on your Bloomberg terminal, CRYP Go. And what you will find is it is a bit of a mixed picture when it comes to these digital currencies today. You do have the two largest moving to the upside, Bitcoin up 2.5%. We are trading around $27,400, so trying to sustain that boost it got uh, after the filing of BlackRock spot ETF. We'll see ultimately where that goes and have more on that in just a second. Ether, meanwhile, up about 1% at 1748. But then you have some of the other digital currencies moving to the downside, including XRP, which of course is still mired uh, in a lot of uncertainty regarding the Ripple versus SEC lawsuit. It's down about 2.5%, and Cardano also down about 1.1% on the day, Matt. Let's focus in, though, on the big guy. Bitcoin gets a shot of optimism after BlackRock files for a spot Bitcoin ETF. ETF in the U.S. Of course, the SEC has resisted allowing such funds in the past, but the question this time is whether it'll be different with a bid from the world's biggest asset manager. Joining us to talk more about this is Bloomberg's Shanali Basic. Shanali? Matt? First of all, a huge vote of confidence when you look at BlackRock and its ability to try to do this after dozens of companies have come forward and tried to create a Bitcoin ETF with no avail from the SEC and an approval for the process. We know Grayscale has sued in, in this regard, trying to get their a conversion of GBTC into an ETF. So what's different when it comes to BlackRock? One thing is a surveillance sharing agreement when it comes to NASDAQ and the ability to really monitor what's going on with this ETF in real time. Another thing that is really interesting is the custodians themselves, because not only do you have Bank of New York Mellon that you're looking at as one of the custodians here when you think about the cash holdings, but Coinbase as well when it comes to the Bitcoin holdings. So you have another vote of confidence, not just in Bitcoin, but in Coinbase also, Matt, really just days after you saw the SEC sue Coinbase for another matter when it comes to the crypto world and the listing of certain assets. So this would be large for Bitcoin given how many people are on the sidelines that would want a spot Bitcoin ETF to gain exposure with the confidence of the likes of BNY Mellon and BlackRock behind it. Will the SEC have more faith in a giant like BlackRock? When you look at what Bloomberg Intelligence is estimating, they expect kind of a 50-50 chance of approval by the end of the year and even more so when you think beyond this year alone. And then what would the implications for price prices actually be, Shanali? Should we see this happen, which of course is no guarantee? Yeah, no guarantee at all, given the stance the SEC has had so far when it comes to Bitcoin ETFs. But again, BlackRock is another game in town. So do they change the equation here? With how many advisor assets are on the sidelines here, you would imagine that it could really encourage a lot more people to get in uh, with a trusted really retirement provider, an ETF provider here like BlackRock. There's a sense that it will encourage more people to come in. But with the uncertainty, you don't see that massive price movement right now. And again, we're still talking about Bitcoin here. We're not talking about uh, all these other types of crypto assets that are still out there that are drawing more scrutiny from the SEC. Of course, I know you'll, I'm sure you'll talk about it a lot. There's Ether that there's a large uh, question around as well when the SEC will handle uh, how they treat Ether and Bitcoin as assets relative to a lot of the other things we're seeing out there. All right, Shanali, thanks very much. Shanali Basic, uh, they are talking to us about the potential uh, for uh, Bitcoin ETF. Joining us to talk more about the business of crypto is Brett Harrison. He is Architect Financial Technologies founder and CEO, and of course, he's a former president of FTX. Before we get to um, uh, anything involving the latter, Brett, I want to talk about Architect because I noticed in your press release from April that you guys are already talking about um, GPT-4 and using AI in crypto before you know we had the big blow up in prices. Um, how would you integrate ChatGPT or GPT-4 into, or how do you integrate it into your product? So part of the goal of Architect is to give institutional grade technology, not just to trading institutions like hedge funds, trading firms, asset managers, but also to sophisticated individual investors. And one of the things that digital assets has allowed for uh, individual investors to be able to do is to be able to access programmatically exchanges a lot more easily. Well, part of that comes with the ability to write 
sophisticated strategies, strategies that can do market making, that can do arbitrage between exchanges. And we think that we can greatly lower the barrier to entry to writing those kinds of strategies by using natural language uh, prompts, for example, be able to uh, arbitrage the price of this coin between these two exchanges and have GPT be able to actually create code for you on the fly using our internal APIs and make it just much easier to be able to be a sophisticated trader in these markets. So even if AI is a killer app um, for your exchange, for your business, you've still got to get customers to come and use it. Has, uh, ha has, has your business been tainted at all by your involvement in FTX? I mean, when you talk to new customers, do they say, hey, we got to deal with this question and get it out of the way first? Uh, no, I mean, long since, you know, talk, talking about FTX, really, I mean, first of all, I look at the, you know, the composition of our team. We have people from X, uh, Jane Street, from DTCC, from RBC. We put together a really stellar group of people who have this long experience in the financial services sector. Secondly, you know, we are a pure software business. Uh, we're not taking customer funds. We're not executing trades on our customer's behalf. We take a security first approach to building software that works in a self-hosted fashion on people's own hardware so they can get direct access to exchanges, not just digital asset exchanges, but also to regulated derivatives exchanges like the CME. And so we're trying to take a pan-asset approach using all of the sort of skills and know-how that we've developed over our combined decades of experience in this industry. On the subject of exchanges, Brett, and it's Kaylee in Washington, obviously one of them, Coinbase, has now been sued by the SEC, and I'm wondering how that lawsuit or the one against Binance may ultimately affect your business. So right now, because of all of the regulatory uncertainty, we're seeing a real turning point for exchanges, a bifurcation of liquidity into what I'm going to see call as like the heavily regulated space, like derivatives under the CFTC at the CME, Bitcoin and Ether future and options, as well as the very unregulated space of you know, non-US exchanges that combine spot and crypto into one sort of vertical clearing model. And both of these are going to continue to develop and grow over the next coming years. I think it's interesting seeing what's happened with the SEC and Coinbase. I think if the goal is to create regulatory clarity, this is certainly going to be a long, expensive path, both in terms of time and money, to go through the litigation. I think with all the pushback from the industry trying to get clarity, trying to make it possible for SEC registrants to be able to operate within the rules, to be able to list and to execute and custodian different digital assets. I think hopefully we will see a more incremental approach from the SEC and the CFTC over the coming years so we don't have to wait just for litigation to be able to get that clarity. In the meantime, though, how optimistic are you on the outlook for crypto in the U.S. specifically, or do you also find yourself needing to look abroad? We are looking globally. I mean, we see firms that are participating in, in you know, the institutional trading of crypto in the U.S. and, of course, in, in places in Asia and in Europe. In the U.S., there is still very high institutional confidence that this is a it's an asset to trade that's going to continue to grow. Obviously, we saw you know EDX launch today. There's going to be different approaches to the trading of crypto. There's Cibo Digital. There's Nasdaq entering the game with custody and possibly eventually an exchange as well. So there's going to be the sort of traditional approach to crypto where you have separate matching and clearing in a sort of separated clearing versus settlement model. And then you're going to see you know exchanges like Coinbase continue to exist and fight and grow. Uh, in the more integrated approach where people can combine trading with more of the utility aspects of digital assets, such as staking and lending and different things like that. Speaking of custody, I noticed uh, EDX is launching, which is an exchange backed by um, Citadel, Fidelity, and Schwab, and they are a non-custodial um, exchange. So they just facilitate the transfer, but they don't ever hold the assets. Do you think that's going to be a leading way forward? I do, and in a couple of different ways. There's the sort of traditional model where you have a separate clearing entity that's facilitating the, the, the final clearing and the movements of money and funds between different customers. There's also a number of startup exchanges that are coming to the fore now that are combining off-chain matching, similar to the way that EDX is doing, the way that NASDAQ would do, but on-chain settlement and clearing, where they're combining kind of the best of the centralized and decentralized exchange world. And I think you're going to see those kinds of models appear as well to compete with the more traditional models, the way that EDX or a traditional exchange like NASDAQ or CME might offer. Do you shift your business maybe more towards, you know, taking a crypto perspective on a TradFi um, business model? I mean, can't you use the blockchain to help um, old banks 
trade assets in a faster um, and more efficient way? Yeah, so our view at Architect is that we're preparing for a world in which the lines between traditional and digital assets continue to blur, whether that's banks that are using private blockchains to settle you know, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars of repos every day, to digital assets being able to wrap real world assets or to tokenize securities. We want to make sure that customers can trade seamlessly to every kind of exchange model, from the most traditional to the most decentralized, all from one single interface and order management system. And so that's exactly why we started this company in the first place. And Brett, final question, as you pursue that vision, are more fundraising plans in your future? Absolutely. You know, we've raised a really great round back in January from some of our um, wonderful investors like Coinbase and Circle, SV Angel, Motivate, and the Salt Funds. But we're all, of course, going to consider opportunities in the future, especially as we look to build out regulated uh, entities underneath the architect umbrella, whether those are under the CFTC or the SEC or both. We're going to look to probably expand our investor set and raise funds in the future. All right, Brett, thanks so much for coming in. Really appreciate your time. Brett Harrison uh, there from Architect Financial Technologies. Now, coming up, former SEC attorney Tom Gorman on the regulatory impact on crypto as Coinbase and Binance and others face charges from the SEC. And can digital asset firms find a home in the U.S.? We'll get the latest findings from our Bloomberg Intelligence Survey next. Plus, to access all the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. Steve's ability on the course may not be etched into any record books, but no, following him around, no, it's clear no, that it's not for lack of trying. Jeez. We were constantly hustling behind him as he caught up with executives in the portfolio companies and reminisced with former and current players. He was a day trader by himself, self, self-made day trader. Yeah. And so he's on the bus after a game in New England, and he's day trading on the bus, and Bill Belichick sees him and cuts him on the spot. You know, in many ways, it's a convention, right, of the people that I don't see maybe once a year. And so it's kind of all come together. My firm, our charity, our fundraising, efforts and then the friends that are around my dad and my brother it's all happens right there as a confluence of all these parts of my life that have found its common center get your fixed income fix watch bloomberg real yield every friday at 1 p.m eastern right here on bloomberg your global business authority critical role in the global economy is changing as the world recalibrates. After decades of stagnation, Japan's leaders are forging a more innovative and sustainable path forward to revitalize the nation. Corporate giants, policymakers, and pioneers tell us how they're doing just that. Every week on Japan Ahead, right here on Bloomberg Television. This June, in honor of Pride Month and Juneteenth, Bloomberg brings you a special equality series every Thursday in June at 1 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg Equality, celebrating inclusion this Pride Month. Crypto. I'm Kaylee Lines in Washington with Matt Miller in New York. Well, from the lack of regulatory clarity to the latest crackdown on major industry players, the crypto space has seen increasing headwinds in recent years. So will the U.S. be able to keep crypto firms on its soil before it gets too late? To get the latest expectations, Bloomberg Intelligence has conducted a survey with analysts and traders around the world and will now bring in uh, the author of that, Nathan Dean, for more. He is here with me in Washington. So you talked to 53 different people.
people uh, from the end of May to the beginning of June. What did they say about the prospects of the U.S. becoming a friendly place or a hospitable one for this industry? So, you know, we asked that question. We had a lovely gentleman from New York tell me that uh, you should rename this as the water wet survey because 96 percent of our respondents felt the U.S. was not a hospitable place. The top two reasons were being the, the lack of regulatory clarity and an, a heightened aggressive enforcement uh, action. They sort of go hand in hand. But one of the more interesting things is, is that when we asked, okay, if the U.S. isn't the place to go, where do you want to go? Well, then the consensus was all over the place. You know, Europe was the number one, but we also had lots of people talking about UAE, Hong Kong, Singapore, pretty much every jurisdiction ranked higher than the United States other than Canada. Uh, and that's just recently because I think some of the Canadian regulatory authorities have started cracking down a little bit more on their licensings. Well, and of course, there's the question of whether ultimately the regulatory authorities are going to get a talking to or get told what to do by Congress down the road on Capitol Hill. But it doesn't seem like people are that optimistic about that prospect either. Yeah, exactly. I mean, 75 percent of our respondents did not think that the United States was going to be able to pass, or at least Congress wouldn't be able to pass, a regulatory framework before the 2024 elections. Please note that this survey, uh, the McHenry Thompson GOP bill, which is a very mm. uh, comprehensive bill, came out during the middle of the survey. So we could have seen attitudes change a little bit. But, you know, that skepticism is out there amongst the crypto industry. And I think a reason why a lot of people want to go to Europe. I'm still surprised that so many people thought it would be possible. I mean, more than 10 percent of respondents thought there was going to be um, a comprehensive legislation uh, on crypto passed before the end of this year um, that boggles the mind. In terms of who should oversee crypto, I thought it was very interesting that most of the respondents or the majority uh, of the respondents said the CFTC should take over rather than the SEC. Yeah, well, you know, the CFTC follows what's known as principles-based regulation. So currently, if I'm CME or ICE and I'm under the CFTC, I have to create my own rule books and so forth in order to meet the principle of the regulation. That doesn't exactly happen over at the SEC. It's more of crossing the T's and dotting the I's. You know, we also saw a lot of the advocates say they wanted a new federal regulator devoted to crypto. We haven't really heard that much in the policy space in 2023. The idea is pretty much never going to happen. But also, I just wanted to throw out there this idea of a self-regulatory organization. It only got about 11.3 percent of our respondents, but this idea of an SRO, something like the National Futures Association or FINRA, is something that, you know, I think could potentially get traction over the next couple of years. But again, this is if Congress is going to do something, and we're ascertaining a 40 percent chance that something gets done before the election. All right. Nathan Dean of Bloomberg Intelligence. Fascinating survey. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about it. And of course, you can find that on your terminal, BI Laws, L-A-W-S, go, is the function you'll use for that. Now to continue this regulatory conversation, joining us is Tom Gorman, a partner at Dorsey and Whitney and author of the blog secactions.com. He is also a former practicing attorney at the SEC. So Tom, great to, of you to join us and give us your perspective today. We appreciate your time. We obviously have seen a litany of enforcement actions coming from the SEC. Is there any sense that Gary Gensler will slow down on this and what do you think he could target next? Well, thank you for having me. Um, no, I think Gary has a very well laid out agenda, and people who aren't listening to him uh, are going to probably regret that. The fact of the matter is, uh, Gary said just died a couple of days ago that he's had dozens of meetings with people. He lays out the, he lays out the rules for people, and then they go out and they basically give lip service to them. They actually said that in one of their enforcement complaints uh, about a week ago against one of the exchanges. And there's no reason to do that. The rules are very clear, despite what everybody says. The rules have been on the books forever. Most of them emanate from a 1946 Supreme Court case. Uh, that thing's been right. on the books for years. Everybody knows what it says. Yeah, so you're referring, of course, to the Howey test, and we're also talking about securities law that is from the 1930s. I mean, these are decades and decades uh, old, to your point, and yet we're talking about digital assets that are relatively more new. So I'm just wondering why you think these cases are winnable for the SEC, that the definition of securities is going to be found to still apply. Well, I, I think these cases are very winnable. They're really very cut and dry. The Howey rules are very simple. You take your, you take people's money, you pool it someplace, you promise them profits from the pooling process, and you give it back. It's a security. People who've been working in this space for years know this, and most of some of the bigger platforms now are actually just coming out and they're telling people, yes, we're really doing that. We're really doing that. 
except they're not. Crypto wants to be treated differently. I don't know why they should. It's it's a different kind of a security, but securities laws have been designed for decades to cover whatever variations come out. Every time you every time you do a variation on one of these things, you don't want to pass a whole new statute. And that's what they want. They want something that's different for them. And the problem, I, I think the problem that, that uh, Gensler's addressing, and I think he's right, is Oh, if you change, if you what they want to do is change it so that they give out less information, you get less investor protection, and the consumers who are trusting their money to these people for because they think it's new, because they think it's sexy, because of whatever they think, uh, don't necessarily get the full picture of what they're doing. And if they don't, then they're not making good judgments. And that's what the securities laws are about. They're about protecting those kinds of investments. Tom, so to me, a lot of these coins seem more like commodities than securities. Certainly that's the case with Bitcoin, right? And the SEC continually denies a Bitcoin ETF. Why do you think that is? Well, the, the coins actually, the coins in and of themselves actually are uh, commodities and they are regulated both, mostly for fraud uh, by the CFTC. But once you go beyond just the coin itself and you really create what becomes a security using the test that I talked about before, you're in a different realm. And once you get into that different realm, you've got different obligations, and that's the difference. If the, if the uh, uh, crypto people want to just stay away from the SEC, they can take coins, they can sell the coins as long as they don't securitize them. And they know the difference between a securitized coin and a non-securitized coin. It's just not that difficult to figure out. All right, but uh, in the case of Bitcoin, even Gensler himself has said it's not a security. And um, w it's a commodity. Uh, we have a lot of ETFs that are made up of commodities. You know, we trade Bitcoin back and forth all day long. It would be nice to have that wrapper on it. Why do you think they're uh, resistant? Or do you think that BlackRock will be successful in getting through its application to um, create a Bitcoin ETF? I think if somebody has a chance of maybe BlackRock, they have a very sophisticated practice. The problem in the past, and there are letters that have been issued by the, the various divisions of the staff of the SEC, is the volatility is such that, they're, that they have a real concern about settling these things at the end of the day, because a lot of them are set up so that they settle each day and you got to mark them to the market. If, in fact, they're are too volatile to do that, then you can't really do that. But if uh, if the uh, product that BlackRock is putting out uh, can contain that volatility such that you can settle these things up every day, decide what the NAV is so that investors know what the value of their, their uh, coins are, then they, then they might have a shot to get it through. If they do, they'll be the first one, but they're going to have to solve that problem. Indeed. Well, we'll all wait and see. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tom Gorman of Dorson and Whitney. We appreciate your time. Now, coming up, a new crypto exchange backed by Citadel Fidelity and Charles Schwab goes live today. We'll have more on that up next. This is Bloomberg. stay a financial center. It will stay our MIA hub. We'll just have a rebalancing onto the continent. And actually, the numbers of who has moved across aren't that big. So it's sort of in the 200 level. And if you think about 15,000 people, that's sort of not that material. Um, and so I do think both will basically continue to grow and continue to be very relevant. What will change, though, and the big thing that's changing, is actually the risk-taking is what's going to move. And so we've historically had risk-taking in the UK. That risk-taking and the assets that go with it, not the people alone, but the assets that go with it, that's the next phase of what we're now moving into. And that will be a material change.
Lots happening on Wall Street. There are so many factors at play today. It remains tight in, in certain parts of the economy. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insight. Crisis is too strong a word, and words like that get used a lot. From businesses most influential and instrumental. America's economy needs a diversity of institutions. That's something that Wall Street pays a lot of attention to. Bloomberg Wall Street Week, live Friday with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Today's CFOs are reshaping the C-suite, positioning companies to meet the next generation of challenges, breaking out of traditional roles. One of the most important things is looking around the corner. Look for Chief Future Officer on Bloomberg. Crypto. I'm Kaylee Lyons in Washington with Matt Miller in New York. Now to some crypto stories that caught our attention this week, including EDX Markets, a new crypto exchange backed by firms like Citadel, Fidelity, and Charles Schwab is live starting today. Unlike Coinbase and Binance, the institutional-only exchange offers a non-custodial model, meaning it doesn't hold clients' digital assets during trading. Instead, it is working with a third-party custodian, according to the CEO. Deutsche Bank has applied for a digital asset license to hold crypto. It's part of the bank's wider strategy to increase profits from fees. The bank has been slowly moving into digital asset custody since 2020. And the EU is delaying its legislation for a digital euro, according to Coindesk. The move comes after a draft bill was recently leaked to the public. It was originally planned to be published on June 28th. So maybe a pause for now on that digital euro project. And who knows, Matt, if a digital dollar is coming anytime soon. Yeah, I, well, I don't think a digital dollar is coming anytime soon. Certainly not from um, U.S. authorities. But it's very interesting that Europe has really taken the lead in this already because they have issued bonds, for example, on the blockchain. Yeah, it's a really good point and one we will continue to follow, including coming up next week here on Bloomberg Crypto. Galaxy's head of research, Alex Thorne, will be joining us next Tuesday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. This is Bloomberg. From the world of politics. We're not going to be relying upon countries whose values we don't share. To the world of business. It's all about corporate power of the end. Balance of power. Live from Bloomberg's Washington headquarters. We're going to be more excited at what's in store for you. How long will it take? How many years? Why don't we take this one day at a time? Good luck. Everybody has a perspective. Every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time, join host Anne-Marie Hordern. It's the one area, really, of bipartisanship. Well, I think we're getting more of it. That's an optimistic. And Joe Matthew. The debt ceiling is looming. How close are we going to get to the line before you start to worry? Alongside Kaylee Lyons. The door was open for regulators to do more. And that puts the Fed between a rock and a hard place. As they deliver news. This is such an important economic issue. He's Plus. no longer trying to run away from that. That really blew some minds. Insight. We can both invest in law enforcement and also make sure that communities feel safe in their own skin. And analysis. I think your audience will get this more than most. This is not the Republican Party that you know. It allows him to do what he did so successfully in 2020 which is run against crazy. From and about politics' biggest power players. This was the zombie case, and it's now more than well alive. That's for sure, uh, with two more potentially to come. I'm willing to have this battle. It is vitally important. This is the intersection of Washington and Wall Street. Bringing people directly to the decision makers right. that impact your investments and your life. Balance of Power, every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern, only on Bloomberg, your global business authority. so intimately linked to the future of the UK. What are you seeing when you go to branches and in the country? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of anxiety at the moment. Um, you know, I think the recovery from the pandemic has been and is continuing to be very strong. So I, I think we're seeing the economy recover. But with rising interest rates, with inflation, those, those are things that, you know, peoples and families and businesses haven't had to deal with for 10 years. So a lot of business owners today haven't had to operate in that environment. So it co is causing quite a lot of anxiety, which means, you know, it, it, for us, because we're up and down the country in branches and offices, we can spend a lot of time talking to businesses and helping them plan and deal with it. But it is, it is very different and it's not something people have had to operate in for a long time.
Business Week Radio. Live weekday afternoons at 3 p.m. Eastern. We got a little bit of talking. Come on, are you guys ready? Harnessing the power of Bloomberg Business Week, Carol Masser and Tim Stanovac bring you the latest news from the worlds of business, technology, politics, and more. How does the Fed play into this and what the Fed does yeah. potentially? This is so exhausting and this is so all-encompassing. Listen on Bloomberg Radio and streaming on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals. I'm John Ehrlichman. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. And I'm Matt Miller. Let's get a quick check on the markets right now. Just bouncing off the 4,400 level, the S&P close to session highs. That said, it is down three-tenths of 1% right now at 4,396. As investors lose a little bit of faith in the big rally built up last week, the U.S. 10-year yield coming down about four and a half basis points. 372 is the level we're looking at there with the Bloomberg dollar index rising and NYMEX crude down, but still above $70. It has been below that at some points during this session, but right now WTI trading at $70.50 a barrel. John? It's been hard to break that bearish trend with crude, and we're seeing that reflected in energy stocks. A few specific corporate stories to recap real quickly, Matt. First of all, Rivian shares still up about 4% on the day as it becomes the latest automaker to team up with Tesla through the supercharger network. We saw the Ford and GM deals. Actually, Tesla's stock is up nearly 50% since that Ford deal was announced last month. FedEx shares under a little bit of pressure right now. In the last couple of quarters, they've had some crowd-pleasing results, but they're still navigating several items and the stock had rallied more than 30 percent this year coming into earnings day so we'll see what happens with fedex later today when the company reports and then a few other names that we are watching big management changes at alibaba we've been talking about that story all day baba shares right now are down about four percent and nike matt is also under some pressure today morgan stanley concerned about the inventory picture for the shoemaker and how that's ultimately going to impact their margins all right, well, we'll continue to watch uh, those stocks. Now, risk-off sentiment, um, aside from the risk-off sentiment in today's equities, Bloomberg's uh, Katie Greifeld is looking at ETF flows and why investors are showing a bit of FOMO in the case of those products. Katie? Well, Matt, it took a while, but it looks like FOMO is winning. Of course, if you look at the ETF universe behind me, we have equity ETF flows look at relative to fixed income ETF flows. And finally, you can see that bright yellow bar equity ETFs have now taken in more year to date than their fixed income counterparts. That's a big sea change from what we were seeing earlier this year, particularly in March when we had a lot of risk off sentiment that sent billions of dollars into fixed income ETFs. But the current standing is that currently equity ETFs have taken in over $100 billion year to date, fixed income ETFs sitting on about $93 billion of inflow. So it took a while, but stocks are back in charge. And that's interesting because earlier today we heard from Matt Miskin of John Hancock saying that this move into risk, it's a little too late. There's just not a lot of risk being priced in. And right now, the time to fix a roof is when the sun is shining. When we look at portfolios that have been overweight risk that have actually done well this year, you've had to have real risk on to do well and outperform this year. We would look to trim into some of this strength and redeploy into higher quality fixed income, take some chips off after such an exceptional run. All right, so um, the question, I guess, is why is it too late? Katie's still here with us, and uh, I guess the rally, what, has come too far too fast? Or are we worried about earnings later on in the year? That's the argument you could make, that basically we've already seen the move. Again, you look at uh, the Qs, for example, in the NASDAQ 100, it's up, what, 38% this year? So if you're coming in right now, you do maybe run the risk of buying, if not at the top, near the top. But again, you look at what investors are actually doing, and Basically, this rally has gotten too big to ignore. And then you think back to the start of this year when everyone was saying this was the year for fixed income. There's still money going into fixed income, but basically now money managers can't ignore the stock market either. 
You know, it's interesting, Katie. The other reality last year was that 60-40 wasn't working. Some people thought it was an anomaly, but I think that that sentiment is still sticking when it comes to whether people want to make a choice between equities or bonds or, or, or maybe put more money to work, as we've heard from a lot of people in recent months in other areas. And I wonder if that's going to skew some of the ETF flows as we continue to navigate through this. Well, also outside of just sort of that black and white question, stocks or bonds, or maybe you put them together in a 60-40, there's also the element of cash as well. That has been one of the big conversations this year is money market mutual funds are offering close to 5% for no credit risk, for no duration risk. And it actually ties in really nicely with this sort of traffic that we're seeing in the ETF market now, where actually you have equity funds winning out. That coincides with actually some money starting to come out of those money market mutual funds. We're still talking about near record levels, near records amount of cash, but still you are seeing a lot of love for equity ETFs, particularly in the past month. And we haven't seen them in the and that love in the first, you know, five months of the year. Katie, thanks very much for that. Let's turn now to the Paris Air Show where politicians and executives from around the world have gathered. There's been lots of talk about supply chains as well as the state of demand. Here's a sample of what some executives in the industry have been telling Bloomberg in Paris. I think right now there's a herd mentality yep. of ordering just to protect future slots. The question is, will all of those aircraft deliver as currently contracted? Will many of them get deferred? We've always tried to be conservative in terms of net output, uh, not to overproduce to the market. We know that is bad for pricing. I don't need to place orders because I already have substantial yep. orders uh, in the order book of both Airbus and Boeing. The problem is that even if you order today, you are not going to see those aeroplanes for the next five years. Joining us now for more insight on what's being discussed in Paris is Sheila Kyolo. Uh, she is an analyst for U.S. equity research at Jefferies, who covers the space, including General Electric and Boeing. But Sheila, I guess um, we have to talk first about the massive order we saw from India's Indigo, right? 500, uh, I think, Air Airbus A320s. And we've seen India uh, order almost a thousand planes with Air India together this year. I mean, that market is just exploding. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt demand is really, really good. Um, we're expecting 50% increases, essentially, round numbers, 1,000 narrow bodies produced last year, that number going up to 1,500 by 2025. Similarly, on wide bodies, about 100 produced last year, that number jumping up to 230 by 2025. So demand is good, and that's only based on 4% air traffic growth versus 6% we, lost, we saw over the last decade. So it's Honestly, the air show is not about placing mega orders because, as the Qatar CFO said, as CEO said, um, you, you can't get a narrow body plane until 2028 with Boeing, 2029 with Airbus, and wide bodies also have five year backlogs. So it's more about can the supply chain meet the current demand? And that's why you're seeing the stocks subpar today um, and trading lower, as um, you know, it's really been concerned with how the supply chain could meet current demand. What issues are they having? Can they be profitable as they do so. so. Well, before we get to supply chain, Sheila, um, what's the point of, you know, these gigantic orders and, and what, what's the size of the backlog? Because it seems to me like, I don't know, Al Backer maybe is a little bit jealous that somebody else could put in a bigger order than he did, right? Um, they seem to be competing for the biggest orders every year. Well, we haven't seen this air show for four years, but typically when they, when they come to Paris. Um, and they're competing for planes that aren't going to be delivered for what, 5, 10, 15 years? Um, they're competing for play, uh, slots about five years out at the moment, um, and they're trying to guarantee those slots. We saw Ryanair do that prior to the air show. Uh, they hadn't done that in some time. So these mega orders are just to guarantee the slots, and oftentimes what we see is not firm orders, so we like to watch firm orders. but. When we count firm orders and MOUs, we're counting about 1,100. The rumor was around 1,500 to 2,000 orders prior to the show, just because people want to put that in. But again, they're putting in the order in hopes of getting an aircraft in 2028. So that's why the, the show was a bit subdued this time around, even though it hasn't happened since 2019, because you can't get a plane for at least five years. 
And Sheila, Matt was talking about General Electric. You cover the company. You were talking to management about some of their takeaways. And obviously, you know, they've got plenty of key partners, and, and including the likes of, of Boeing and Airbus. What do you make of, I suppose we call it a transition or just a further spotlight of General Electric on the aerospace business and, and all the push they have made in, in, in trying to convince the market that is the best place for them to be? Sure. Um, you know, GE is one of our top picks along with Boeing and Transdime. Really, the reason why we like GE is once Spernova spins in 2024, that's their energy business. This is a 70% services asset, and that's levered to commercial aerospace, not only on the OE side, original equipment with engine supplier as the number one supplier of narrow body engines and wide body engines around the world, but they have a big installed base of engines, and we continue to think the servicing element will outpace as people continue to travel. So that's really why we like GE. They had an investor day this morning uh, in Paris, and they talked about their services business outperforming expectations, but some of those uh, better results are being offset by you know, supply chain issues and delays at MRO shops. So, so do, you, do you think investors should think more of it uh, as a repair and maintenance play, e even more so than, than the jet engines themselves? Uh, I certainly do think so. Uh, GE is one of the highest leverages to commercial aftermarket in our coverage at 70%. If you exclude the military, we count it as about 50, but um, it's around 50 to 70%. Um, and then, you know, followed by a pure play, which is more of a trans dime or a hyco in the aftermarket segments. Those are, those are the names investors look to. Um, but we clearly think the aftermarket is where it's at as aircraft get out of warranty and hit their first service a shop visit. Um, it is a pretty lucrative event for the OEMs and aftermarket providers, and you're going to start seeing that in 2023 and 2024, and we think expectations are way too low, um, not only for GE, but across our coverage. So um, the best way to play the commercial aerospace, in our view, is through the services businesses, which GE actually has a large business given their installed base. Right. Well, we've seen GE stock also double in the past um, 12 months, so it's it's been doing very well. What about Boeing versus Airbus, Sheila? How does that shake out, you know, post Paris Air Show? Um, where, where does each one stand? Uh, so we're very bullish on Boeing. Uh, we think a story investors miss is Boeing's guidance is $10 billion of free cash flow sometime in 2025, 2026. We think that number could balloon up to 12 to $15 billion by 2026. And how is that? That's because of pricing. Pricing on the 737, the 787. Right now, what Boeing is shipping 2023 to 2025 is aircraft from a parking lot from three years ago. And those aircraft mm. have about half the free cash flow per aircraft versus what they're going to ship in 2026. And that's why you're seeing all these airlines put in mega orders, because they know if they don't get a slot in 26, 27, it's going to get, you know, at least 5% you know, higher per year for the price of the aircraft and Boeing's getting tighter. So um, that's, I think, the story that investors don't have yet with Boeing. They just view Got 10 it. billion as management's target and we're way above that. Got it. Sheila, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Sheila Kyle there from Jeffries talking to us about, uh, well, <laughs> Boeing, Airbus, General Electric and the Paris Air Show. Coming up, news about an all-electric Escalade from GM's annual general meeting as it chases Tesla's market share. This is Bloomberg. Everybody want to be a consultant, and what are all these consultants doing? 
Well, David, I think that we actually defy the label consultant because sometimes consultant seems to imply that we only give advice. And when you look at what Accenture does, we're really different than the traditional version of a consultant. We're really about relevance and results. And that's what is uh, driving our business. What about a consulting project? In my example, I'm the CEO. I have a problem. I call you up. I say, solve my problem or give me a solution. We don't operate as big companies permanently in crisis mode. And so when you think about like how long does it solve things, a lot of it starts with you know, the company being willing to set aggressive goals. And so what we are trying to do now is work with our clients to work differently and to work faster. jobs numbers are released. Bloomberg brings you crucial data at terminal speed and instant expert analysis. Nobody covers jobs day like Bloomberg. Welcome to the world of decentralized finance. Bloomberg's covering all things crypto, the people, the transactions, and the technology. Bloomberg Crypto, only on Bloomberg TV and radio. Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can answer phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm John Ehrlichman with Matt Miller. Uh, one of the things we wanted to talk about today is what's happening in the auto market. Americans are taking auto loans that exceed the worth of the cars that they are buying. Used car loan to value ratios increased to 125 in the first three months of this year. And Matt, that means a uh, car owner's loan is worth 125% of the vehicle's value. Credit reporting from TransUnion saying that could foreshadow higher delinquencies ahead. And, and a, a part of that is you know, we're, we're trying to figure out where vehicle values go from here after skyrocketing as we sort of came into the pandemic and, and went through the pandemic. Yeah, a a absolutely. Um, I think, you know, consumers are having this, we're already having a stretch to buy cars um, because prices have risen so much. Um, dealers, a lot of them are charging uh, ADM, so extra money over MSRP. And then now that rates are higher, um, you know, the loan becomes a lot more expensive. Of course, as soon as you drive it off the lot, a new car becomes worth a little bit less. You don't get the uh, kind of um, degradation that you had previously, but we do already see delinquencies rising when you look at auto loans, um, and it's a concern that I think Wall Street is waking up to. Yep, certainly watching it from the banking connection as well, so we'll be watching that, but that gets us to our stock of the hour, Matt, which is General Motors. Now, the shares have been weaker, the company holding its annual meeting uh, in which it announced plans to reveal the electric Escalade IQ August 9th. We want to get more on the electric vehicle race, and to do so, let's bring in Barclays Senior Autos Analyst Dan Levy. Dan, great to have you with us, and obviously a busy day for GM and uh, walking us through the roadmap of their vehicles. I guess on the Escalade specifically, what was your reaction to their big plans? Yeah, th thanks, John, for, for having me. Look, um, I think the Escalade is part of a broader model lineup that we've heard from GM. They've, there's been a steady cadence of announcements and model rollouts, um, and I think this one was in the roadmap. We expected it. The Escalade is certainly one of the marquee models, and GM, I think, very similarly to Ford, has been approaching their EV model rollout from a perspective of franchise 
sizes of strength. We know that the Escalade is one of the marquee vehicles. And so it's not a surprise that this is one that they wanted to uh, electrify as this is a vehicle where they've typically held a lot of brand power and a lot of pricing power. Yeah, and I think the numbers are that by 2025, they want to be rolling out something like a, a million EVs uh, in North America a year, something in that neighborhood. So being able to have sort of a, a little bit of everything, to your point, would help. Yeah, there's there's going to be a wide a wide lineup, um, and, and in fact, we've already seen that from them already. You know, the, the four EVs that they've already announced, uh, or that that are set to, to produce this year, in terms of Hummer, Lyric, uh, Blazer, and, and Equinox, these all hit on slightly different segments of of the market, and obviously, it's expanding from there. Um, now, the volume target that you talk to, I think this gives you a sense. This is roughly, uh, it's a run rate volume target by the end of 2025. Um, we actually are somewhat skeptical that they actually hit this target, similar to other automakers. Uh, look, I think the ramp to EV, while this is something that they are fundamentally committed to, like others, we think that, you know, there are a number of challenges that we've seen along the way on ramp. Uh, the, the, the ramp of the, the Ultium cells has, you know, gone very steadily. Um, and then the other piece of this is that the EV environment has shifted somewhat. You know, in a report that we published last week, said, listen, we were graduating from a period the last couple of years of EV euphoria in which the market expected demand to be really uh, infinite and it was a question of supply. And now that dynamic has shifted a bit. So... You know, we think that GM and others are still very much committed to this transition, but it may not go as quickly as some of the targets that they've laid out. I mean, when you have the Escalade, you also have a Yukon, a Tahoe, a Suburban. I mean, they own that market of giant SUVs in the U.S. Aren't they all going to go electric? And is there anything stopping uh, customers from just switching from the gas-powered version of the giant truck they like to the electric version of the same truck? They, they eventually will all go electric, but I think what we've also heard from GM and others is, you know, a, somewhat of a measured tone on, on this transition, showing that there is a tail of, of ice. I think you're going to see that, especially on the truck side, right, that while they are certainly electrifying with, you know, they uh, Silverado is going to be starting later this year, and then you also have um, Sierra that they announced. So while you're getting those models out, there is still a, a tail of ice. I think you're going to get something similar on the large SUV side where you're correct. They've dominated. Um, and I think they want to maintain, you know, they want to play on the EV side, but to the extent that there is still a tail of ice, they're going to want to maintain that exposure, knowing that those ice vehicles are the vehicles responsible for essentially all of their profit. Dan, great to get your perspective. Thanks, as always, for joining us. Dan Levy covers the auto sector for Barclays. And we're going to stay on that theme of EVs coming up because the Bloomberg New Energy Finance team has put a price on the entire electric vehicle market. It's a big one. This is Bloomberg. about your job? I think the, the people, I mean, ultimately we're a people business. A lot of what my job is as, as CEO of the company is to 
and give those people sort of motivation to tell them where we're going, to encourage them to come up and do their best work, to encourage them to collaborate. Sometimes you sort of think you're almost a psychologist, you know, as you are a business leader, I think, sometimes. And, and so what's your best piece of advice? I, think I love um, pitches. I love being sort of leading from the front, if you like, and spending time with teams. I love to see the work that we're doing. When we pitch for a piece of new business, often when we come together. So I, tell, I guess I try and put myself in the seat of the client. What's the client going to think when they see this work? Are they going to be excited? Is it going to turn their brand around? How is it going to resonate with their consumers? So as much as possible, I think probably I try and play that role. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm John Erlichman with Matt Miller. Time for today's For What It's Worth. Our number today, a big one, $57 trillion as in dollars. That's how big the market for electric vehicles could be by the year 2050. The Bloomberg New Energy Finance team has been crunching the numbers on this. Just to break the data down further, Matt, the U.S. would represent about a fifth of that. China would make up about a third. And while the majority of uh, those EVs are passenger electric vehicles, commercial electric vehicles, e bikes Buses, they make up a big part of that number as well at about 25%. Yeah, it sounds absolutely huge. I'm pretty sure it goes like nine trillion by 2030, and then you know 40 trillion by 2040, and 57 by uh, 2050. Of course, you have to add inflation um, to get to that number. And you know we already have a gigantic internal combustion engine uh, car market, so you're expecting to replace pretty much the entire fleet by then. It doesn't surprise me hearing that big of a number when I see how much prices are rising today if you look at you know electric pickup truck you can easily spec it up to a hundred thousand dollar vehicle or more if you're going for the Hummer John so um, I guess you know inflation uh, is a big part of that picture no doubt I, I feel like dr. evil would like an opportunity to update his <laughs> his his big billion dollar numbers although Dan Levy had some interesting commentary before the break Matt just on whether or not this market size short term is as big as everybody thinks and maybe think about the the rush into streaming by everybody in Hollywood only to learn that maybe that market is not as robust as what they had hoped for at least short term yeah I think you know the problem being charging of course it seems to be the one major drawback from um, the demand side on production as Dan was mentioning you've got to ramp up battery production uh, as well but um, it, if charging doesn't become easier and faster more quickly um, you're not gonna see full-scale adoption you'll still see big sales numbers though I mean 20% is um, the expectation for uh, the EV slice of new car sales this year We'll be watching those numbers closely. And you mentioned Tesla stock will continue to watch. For Matt Miller, I'm John Ehrlichman. This is Bloomberg.
So Fabian, talk to me a little bit about the ocean. It covers 70% of the planet. It gives us food, it gives us jobs, it gives us, of course, oxygen. We're taking too many fish out, we're polluting it, we're making it warmer, and only 3% of it is protected. What frustrates you the most about this? The basic frustration is our ignorance. Our ignorance about how integral ocean is to not only our well-being, but to uh, our existence. Uh, and for far too long, we've been using the ocean as an endless resource in a garbage can. Imagine uh, our planet is a three-dimensional system. The ocean represents 99% of our world's living space, about 3.4 billion cubic kilometers of volume, within which the vast majority of biodiversity lives and thrives. And, and that's what we're beholden to. That is what makes us possible as a species. Access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. Today's CFOs are reshaping the C-suite, positioning companies to meet the next generation of challenges, breaking out of traditional roles. One of the most important things is looking around the corner. Look for Chief Future Officer on Bloomberg. Resistance live from Studio Two at Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York. Romain Basak here, kicking you off to the close. U.S. stocks starting the holiday shortened week on a bit of a back foot here. Nine of the 11 S&P sectors are under pressure here in the red. That's coming off, of course, a phenomenal five-week run for that benchmark index that pushed the S&P into a technical bull market and pushed the S&P into overbought territory. The question now really is whether the economic conditions and whether the corporate earnings are going to support these newfound valuations. Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson and saying, well, that has yet to materialize. He said that he's concerned the stocks are as stretched as they can get right now, and he expects a slowing inflation to have a direct negative impact here on revenue growth. That's not necessarily reflected in consensus forecasts just yet, and maybe that's a big part of the reason you're seeing some oscillations here in the market on this Tuesday afternoon. Now, part of the dower sentiment today is actually tied to the disappointment out of China, a slow stimulus rollout. Now, remember, investors went into the weekend prime for China's cabinet to announce new economic support measures, but the State Council stopped short of releasing any specific proposals, saying that the government is studying new measures that will be adopted in a timely manner. That puts stocks from Asia to Europe and here in the U.S. on the back foot. If you're looking for any bright spots out there, well, you can find it in the home building space. U.S. markets right now with home building stocks up for a third day as a group to a record high. This after that big Scarsdale surprise we got in the latest data from the U.S. Census Bureau. Housing starts unexpectedly surging in May by the most going back to 2016. Strength in the industry, we should point out, that corroborates Fed Chair Powell's comments last week of stabilization in that housing sector. In fact, when we talk about housing, Abigail Doolittle, home builders, along with semiconductors, just two of the three big sectors out there in the S&P 500 that are sitting right now at record highs. It's pretty amazing, Romain, that we do have these record highs for chips and for home builders. Let's take a look at this chart, though, because there's some interesting divergences to think about, too. So what we're looking at here uh, in white, that's a semi, the S&P 500 semi uh, cap index. In blue, we have the home builders. So both of those at record highs relative to where we were pri prior to the pandemic or after the pandemic, actually, I should say. And then in orange, we have the SOX. So the SOX or the main chip index, it's actually not at a record high. So there's a big divergence between the S&P 500 chip index and the SOX. And then take a look at the Dow transports. Uh, I don't know Dow theory at all, uh, despite what uh, perhaps with my charting background I should, but it's not something I've ever 
never really paid attention to, but I will say there's a pretty big divergence between old school Dow transports, which are still in a bit of a range or even a downtrend from the recent peak, and those other indexes. Supporting the idea that some of these uh, sectors, Romain, might be a little bit overdone, you were talking about that RSI and the S&P 500. Let's take a look at the stocks because this is really pretty extraordinary, and we're not going to just look at the RSI. We're actually going to look at the stocks relative to its 200-day moving average, uh, and then we also have the valuation, which is sky high. So the SOX right now is, uh, uh, it's well, well over its 200-day moving average, remain by 32%. Valuation, 32 times forward year, that's just slightly below the peak, maybe suggesting that some consolidation could be ahead for chips remain. All right, Abigail, do a little a nice look at where we stand right now when it comes to valuations. Matt Maley, Miller Tabak's chief market strategist, joining us right now to give his take. And Matt, I do want to start where Abigail left off here, the idea that when you look at some of the key measures, whether it's RSI, whether it's 200-day moving average, you can look at some of these major indices and certainly make a case that things have maybe gotten a little bit overbought. Yeah, it, it sure seems that way, uh, Romain. The, the you know obviously we've had these unbelievable runs. I mean you know the uh, the Nasdaq up like a forty percent and uh, uh, from October I should say. Uh, but uh, and and you know of course everything has been so narrow that we worry about that uh, as well. But I think the, the the one of the things too is that we, we are reaching an over uh, you know a, an overbought situation where the valuations are getting quite extended. You know we have now we have uh, you know the S and P five hundred really reaching that twenty times. Uh, forward earnings and 2.4 times sales. And those are the types of things where you, where you sit there and you say, wait a minute, uh, is the second half of the year really going to be that much better that, so that these valuations can play catch up? And, uh, you know, a lot of people are talking about a soft landing. Well, soft landing isn't, you know, increased growth. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's really what you need when the market gets as expensive as it is and over overbought as it is. So yeah. uh, we, you know, run into a little bit of a rough, rough patch as we get past the end of the second quarter here. Well, I am curious about the second half of the year, Matt, and I am curious when you sort of look at the price action in the market, whether you think that is a rally that was on the back of expectations for either a stronger economy or stronger earnings, or was this simply kind of a trend chasing amid all the AI hype and some of the other hype uh, here that it maybe gave folks uh, some short-term optimism? Yeah, I, I think it's the, uh, it's, the four, it's the it's the latter here. I mean, we just say what we... What is the uh, you know, what have we really seen to see that the second half is really going to be that much better? It's interesting. The it, really not a lot. Uh, you know, there are some things out there. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you mentioned the housing uh, uh, earlier, and of course, consumer confidence has been going up a little bit. But uh, we also see where the consumers we're seeing cracks in, in that area where we have you know, record high levels of uh, of credit card debt, and we heard a, a whole slew of retail uh, uh, companies saying that the the, uh, the, uh, the consumer is pulling in their horns. But it was what I really. Think drove this market was the, the hype with AI and the liquidity injection that went along with it. I mean, you saw what happened with the Fed and in, in, injected all sorts of liquidity uh, in March uh, when uh, SVB failed. And uh, we saw that with a big jump in their balance sheet. Then we also had this issue with the debt ceiling and we weren't issuing any more bonds. That has completely changed. So uh, that liquidity issue, I think, exacerbated and made, this, made the AI thing uh, seem much better than it actually is. Kind of the way the internet did uh, uh, back in the late 1990s when liquidity was injected uh, to help the situation with the Y2K. So uh, I guess my point is, if the second half was really was looking a lot better, I'd feel more comfortable about where the stock market is. But right yeah. now, it really isn't seeing that big kind of. If anything, people are saying are, are saying it's going to be okay because it's not going to. It's going to be less bad than people were thinking. Yeah. Not that it's going to be that much better. But that gets to a, a bigger question here about if, if things end up being a little bit less bad than maybe thought. But at the same time, worse maybe in the second half than what it was in the first half. Does that mean by default we get a sell-off or do we just end up in some sort of range-bound status where we hold on uh, to a good chunk of the gains that we've had so far this year? Well, I, it's just very hard. I mean, very, very rarely, and I actually can't really find a time in the past, when the market gets this far, this expensive, the the the... the we never the, the fundamentals never play catch up enough. The best case scenario is that they meet in the middle. The, the, the stock prices come down, or the market prices come down, and the and, and, and the and the undermining fundamentals improve a little bit. They meet somewhere in the middle. Worst case scenario, of course, is that the economy gets worse and the market really uh, collapses. Not necessarily looking for that. I'm just saying that when you get this kind of a uh, uh, situation in terms of overvaluation, uh, it's it's just very very difficult uh, for the economy to play catch up the, the way the people are. 
hoping for. And again, you don't, I mean, it's not enough to just avoid a recession mm -hmm. when the market is, is this expensive. If we were trading at 16 times earnings, I'd be singing a different song. But right now, it's just a, it's just a, a tough thing to do because history tells us, tells us that. All right, Matt. Always great to talk to you. Great insights as always. Matt Maley there, Miller Tabak's chief market strategist, helping us kick off here to the close on this Tuesday afternoon. Coming up, a closer look at China and a closer look at that trip that the U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken took and that meeting, that handshake with Xi Jinping. Plus, a big week ahead for the Fed. Chair Powell scheduled to be on Congress to testify and three nominees for the Fed, uh, nominated by President Biden, set to have their confirmation hearings. We'll have a breakdown for you as to what to expect in the big take on the Bloomberg terminal focus on private equity firms and well you remember when Jay Powell said he was going to raise rates some of these private equity firms looked him in the face and decided he wasn't serious five percentage points later they're now having to reckon with the fallout from that decision and all that and more coming up in a bit this is Bloomberg Everybody want to be a consultant and what are all these consultants doing well David I think that we actually defy the label consultant because sometimes consultant seems to imply that we only give advice and when you look at what Accenture does we're really different than the traditional version of a consultant we're really about relevance and results and that's what is uh, driving our business what about a consulting project in my example I'm the CEO I have a problem I call you up, I say, solve my problem or give me a solution. We don't operate as big companies permanently in crisis mode. And so when you think about, like, how long does it solve things, a lot of it starts with, you know, the company being willing to set aggressive goals. And so what we are trying to do now is work with our clients to work differently and to work faster. On the next episode of The Circuit, we're inside OpenAI, and we're going to get some answers. I think a lot of us at OpenAI joined because we thought that this would be the most important technology that humanity would ever create. One of the problems with the current discourse is that it's too much of the fear-based versus hope-based. Watch The Circuit with Emily Chang Thursdays, 10 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Television, or 8 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com or the Bloomberg app on connected TVs. With the latest Fed decision out of the way, members of the FOMC are now free to speak. Fed Chair Jay Powell, he'll be on Congress for two days of uh, testimony and three nominees to the Federal Reserve uh, Board by President Biden will have their confirmation hearings on the Hill as well. Several other members of the Fed also scheduled to speak. Michael McKee joining us right now, Bloomberg Economics and Policy Correspondent. Of all those names, who's the most important? It's a trick question. <laughs> it's a trick question. <laughs> this is not Animal Farm, but some yeah. animals are more equal than others yeah, yeah, yeah. at the Fed, and that's going to be Jay Powell, who testifies tomorrow and Thursday before Congress, his semi-annual monetary policy testimony, probably won't have a whole lot new in it since he just had a news conference last week, but it is going to be widely followed on Wall Street. Austin Goolsby is also speaking tomorrow, and as he's been one of the biggest doves, it might be interesting to hear what he has to say. Uh, as you mentioned, we have the three nominees up there, but I'm not sure they're going to be uh, big newsmakers. They don't want to upset people because they're trying to get confirmed, but we might get something about how they feel about the next set of interest yeah. rate questions. And then, of course, on Thursday, as I mentioned, Jay Powell is back. Well, and Loretta Mesta talking monetary policy Thursday. Uh, and with Jefferson, Cook, and Kugler, I mean, obviously, Jefferson and Cook are kind of known quantities to a certain extent for Fed watchers. Kugler may be a little bit of an outlier, given what she's now at the World Bank, and most people haven't really paid a whole lot of attention to her, at least not from a monetary policy perspective. Yeah, in general, when you go up for your confirmation yeah. hearing, you will 
say, I can't tell you how I'm going to vote because I haven't been on the committee oh, yet. Boy. I'm going to look at all the data. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do the right thing. Yeah. Uh, you probably won't hear her say, I think we should raise rates or yeah. I think we should hold. Well, let's talk about the data. We're going to get some uh, important data this week. We have uh, housing data this morning. What about construction jobs? And that's always kind of seen as kind of a leading indicator to yeah. a certain extent. Uh, well, this is kind yeah. of uh, outlines Jay Powell's problem. We had 21, uh, 21% increase in housing starts in the month of May, which is absolutely huge. And the spillover from that is look at the hiring. The blue bars are the total number of construction jobs, no slump there. The white is housing construction, people who do residential construction. And you see how strong that's been coming out of the pandemic. And we've got the yellow line there. I put that in there. That's engineering and heavy civil uh, construction jobs as we start to see a lot of plant construction from the uh, CHIPS bill and the IRA, the uh, sort of uh, yeah. uh, build out the infrastructure bill that uh, the Biden administration got through. All right. Uh, Michael McKee, our, our international economics and policy correspondent here. A nice look uh, as what we can expect to hear out of some of the Fed members. A quick peek there at some of the economic data to come and, of course, a discussion today about the economic data we got this morning. Sarah House, senior economist over at Wells Fargo, joining us right now. And Sarah, I do want to start off with this home builder data that we got this morning. I mean, even by the most optimistic uh, of expectations, this was pretty much blown out of the water. And there seems to be this resiliency here in the labor, in the housing market, excuse me, that even Jay Powell has acknowledged uh, that he's going to have trouble trying to get under control. Right, so I think what we did see is not just in terms of those housing starts, but I think what was even more interesting was the upside surprise in building permits. So it wasn't just a, a weather event that there is more momentum in terms of residential construction coming. And this was supposed to be and still is the most interest rate sensitive category of the U.S. economy. But I think it goes to show that maybe the U.S. economy isn't quite as sensitive to higher interest rates as, as what was presumed. So if you look at the Bloomberg Economic Surprise Index with today's data, it's now at a two-year high, showing that greater than expected resiliency. There's been some pretty good analysis out there, Sarah, by uh, folks w w way smarter than me that have talked about the five percentage points of rate hikes that we've gotten and how much of that could be sort of directly attributable to the drop in inflation that we've seen. And there's been a lot of folks discussing this idea that what we've seen so far in that drop in CPI and the drop in PCE, you can't really pin it completely on what we've gotten out of Fed hikes alone. Some of it still is related to just the easing of supply constraints that we've seen, both in terms of physical goods. So I think that's certainly playing a role in the disinflation helped along by by autos. But I think um, that some of it too can be at least starting to see some of the hints from from the tighter monetary policy. So even within autos, for example, those financing costs matter for the transaction prices that get logged in these official measures. So it still is very hard to um, attribute what is coming from. Fed, Fed tightening versus what's coming from from other factors, but I think ultimately we still have a long way to go on the inflation front. So I think that's going to keep the Fed in this relatively hawkish tone for for a while still. When we look ahead uh, to the next couple weeks here and the economic data, a little bit a light in terms of what we're expecting here, but there's going to be some interesting reads here when it comes to PMIs and manufacturing, and we'll get some insight into the services sector as well. What are you sort of modeling out, Sarah, for the second half when it comes to spending, whether it's on the services side or the goods side. Yeah, so in terms of overall activity as, as we head into the second half of the year, so we're expecting momentum to continue to cool, but we're not looking for a recession, at least not this year. So we do think it's likely we'll still get some degree of a pullback in terms of GDP as well as employment, but that's probably more likely to be an early 2024 event. So we still have quite a bit of momentum. You know, you had that little Freudian slip, I think, in terms of the resiliency of the housing market, and you mentioned labor market, and I think that's a big part of it is we're still seeing this resilience out of the labor market, and that's holding up your overall spending dynamics and, I think, making it difficult for, for the Fed to get its uh, get its get the inflation side of its mandate under control, given that momentum that we continue to see. I know we're so focused on 2 percent, but to be down at 4 percent, down at least on the headline number there, Sarah, from 9 percent a year ago here, and then you look at economic conditions that have held up, you look at a lot of the positive signs in the labor market, why can't we start? to sort of maybe find some solace in the potential for that soft landing. Well, I think we're 
we're, you know, we haven't fully given up on it. Um, I think it's still possible. It's just not probable in, in our view. So I think so much of it hinges on the labor market and that holding up more strongly than, than the inflation side. And I think in some ways, the longer the labor market holds up, that gives more time for some of the supply-specific uh, uh, impacts of inflation to, to fade. So I think that gives more time for, for these pandemic distortions to, to correct themselves. So it keeps the door open, but there's still a long way to go. You're looking at the core PC deflator still 4.7%, so still well over double the Fed's target. And we just usually don't see such a big step down in core inflation without seeing an outright uh, collapse in, in demand. So that's what we're still worried about, is if the Fed's really serious about getting inflation even close to two, its 2% target, is that yeah. it's likely to require some pullback in demand associated with the recession. All right, Sarah, great to talk to you. Sarah House there, senior economist at Wells Fargo. We'll be back in a moment. A lot more coverage coming up. This is Bloomberg. on the course may not be etched into any record books, but no, following him around, no, it's clear no, that it's no, not for lack of trying. Jeez. We were constantly hustling behind him as he caught up with executives in the portfolio companies and reminisced with former and current players. He's a day trader by himself, self, self-made day trader. Yes. And so he's on the bus after a game in New England, and he's day trading on the bus, and Bill Belichick sees him and cuts him on the spot. You know, in many ways, it's a convention, right, of the people that I don't see maybe once a year. And so it's kind of all come together, my firm, our charity, our fundraising, efforts and then the friends that are around my dad and my brother it's all happens right there as a confluence of all these parts of my life that have found its common center BSO Now is your online home for weekly Boston Symphony Orchestra and Boston Pops performances. See new concerts that go behind the scenes, plus acclaimed archival concerts. Visit bso.org slash now, where the music plays on. BSO season sponsor, Bank of America. My hope and expectation is we will have better communications, better engagement going forward. That's certainly not going to solve uh, every problem between us, far from it. But it is critical to doing what we both agree is necessary, and that is responsibly managing the relationship. It's in the interest of the United States to do that. It's in the interest of China to do that. It's in the interest of the world. Anthony Blinken there, Secretary of State here in the U.S., U.S.-China relations, trying to move past months of icy tensions here. That big handshake that we saw between Blinken and Xi, providing maybe some degree of optimism, whether that carries over into something substantive still remains to be seen. Enda Curran joining us right now from our Bloomberg Bureau uh, down in D.C. And Enda, I thought the most interesting thing out of this was the official response uh, by a spokesperson for the Chinese government saying that Xi's meeting with Blinken was out of courtesy. What does that mean? Yeah, I mean, obviously this was a fairly managed process remain on, on the Chinese side. Uh, there's been some commentary around the, 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 the seating plan, for example, in Secretary Blinken's meeting with Xi Jinping, uh, the commentary being that he didn't quite get the same place uh, beside Xi as previous Secretaries of State uh, have received, indicating just how far uh, South relations between China and the U.S. have gone. But nonetheless, the point is, this was the first really major meeting of a U.S. official in Beijing in five years. The 
expectations going into it were quite low or managed that way for good reason and coming out of it of course the takeaway is that at least both sides are talking again they've yeah. agreed maybe they can keep on track for further meetings between officials but of course nothing very tangible came out of it in terms of concrete uh, agreements some chat around perhaps education ties improving there but nothing that suggests it, th these meetings were a game changer for the, for the relationship and, and the, what do we know about the discussions over some of the military issues particularly what's been going on surrounding Taiwan Yes, yeah, so the big headline was, would they reopen uh, Beijing to Washington, D.C. communications on the military front again? Those were shut down after Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan last year. Well, all indications are that that hotline is not reopening. There remains a fairly frosty reception between both militaries. And this is worrying given the tensions in the South China Sea. We've had some near misses there between ships and, of course, aircraft in recent weeks. And it's, it was one of the main focus points going into this meeting, whether they could patch up some ground or that they didn't. They have, however, agreed to keep talking. So maybe Maybe over the coming months they might make progress on that, but for now the big takeaway certainly is that the military to military communication lines remain closed. All right, and occurring down there uh, in our D.C. Bureau, a look at the trip uh, that the U.S. Secretary of State just made to China and whether relations there are thawing. And while there is a focus, of course, on the military and the geopolitical issues, there's also a big focus on the economy and the businesses there. We've been keeping an eye on a lot of the stocks, including Alibaba, the Chinese e-commerce giant, seeing a C-suite shakeup. Analysts over at Forsyth Bar Asia writing that the move brings old management back to the stage, saying, quote, not sure whether it's a good thing for Alibaba, given now the key should be new growth drivers and the restructuring plan. Caroline Hyde, the co-host of Bloomberg Technology, joining us right now to talk a little bit more about this. This is a pretty big shakeup, and I guess I kind of feel the same way as that quote there is. I'm not sure whether this is a good or bad thing. Neither does the market. Yeah. It's selling off. Yeah. I mean, we've seen Chinese names under pressure because of the lack of stimulus that people were anticipating. But also, yeah, this is the old guard. And when they say old guard, these are basically co-founders of the business coming back. So Joe, Joe Tsai, for many, they would know him more as the owner of the Brooklyn Nets yeah, or some yeah. pretty fancy real estate here in New York City, but he's going to come as chairman. Important when he's got a legal background, he understands governance. He's also international, so he's going to be understanding the needs and wants of U.S. investor base, the Chinese investor base, probably navigating that geopolitical headwinds that they currently face. But Eddie Wu, too, was more of a backseat person, but he is a technologist at heart. He yeah. understands all the various parts of the business, and he's also got an investment background like Joe Tsai. Remember, they're basically going to be heading up the investment business now because Alibaba yeah. is splitting up into six baby babas. Into six baby babas. Eddie Wu was a name that I, I guess I hadn't tracked. Obviously, everyone's yeah. familiar with, with Joe Tsai. Daniel uh, Zhang, what, talk to me a little bit about what he does. Well, or, many were wondering whether this is a demotion. He had been for eight years the CEO, yeah. and now he's suddenly splitting off to helm the cloud part of the business. Okay. But this is the crown jewel. This is where the artificial intelligence focus comes mm -hmm. in. This is where the next generation of Alibaba growth comes in. Remember, all of these people coming back at a time where the shares are off 70% since 2021 because of the regulatory headwinds, the oversight from China. But Daniel, we actually had a former Alibaba executive who had been the 52nd employee there. He was very close with, well, Jack Ma, the founder, and he came on Brian Wong and said, "Look, this isn't a, this isn't any sort of like moving to the left. This is actually for Daniel, probably something he came up with himself. Mm -hmm. He knows he's got the tenacity to bring the next driver of growth." Anyone watching these changes, the first question you're going to ask is, "Is how much growth is this company going to be allowed yeah. to have?" There's obviously a leash here that links back to uh, Chinese authorities, and it's always not clear to foreign investors just how long that leash is. Well, now it's becoming a holding company. Yeah. And are the Joe Tsai and, yeah. and Mr. Wu able to, with their investment tenacity, mm. be able to take it on to the forward-looking growth? Maybe they start taking chunks in other areas of growth for Alibaba in the future. Mm. And it's the current executives who helm the smaller six businesses that then have to navigate internal politics, have to understand how you can get along with the government mm. and indeed with international growth. But yeah, you're right. At the end of the day, this is a company that is a shadow of its former self because Jack Ma dead to yeah. fight back against perhaps the regulatory oversight yeah. coming from China. All right, uh, Caroline Hodge, she's the co-anchor of Bloomberg Technology. You can check her out every day at noon, New York time. Of course, a look at Alibaba. As she said, those shares are down here on the day. We've actually seen a broader market sell-off globally here from Asia to Europe and now here in the U.S. The damage isn't tremendous there, but take a look at the Chinese Golden Dragon Index, which includes a lot of those ADRs that trade here in the U.S., down 5% on the day. This is Bloomberg.
Lebanon will stay a financial center. It will stay our MIA hub. We'll just have a rebalancing onto the continent. And actually, the numbers of who has moved across aren't that big. So it's sort of in the 200 level. And if you think about 15,000 people, that's sort of not that material. Um, and so I do think both will basically continue to grow and continue to be very relevant. What will change, though, and the big thing that's changing, is actually the risk-taking is what's going to move. And so we've historically had risk-taking in the UK. That risk-taking and the assets that go with it, not the people alone, but the assets that go with it, that's the next phase of what we're now moving into. And that will be a material change. Mm -hmm.